All right, welcome to continuation of the developer commentary run of Half-Life Alex. See, my stream's already been up for like an hour already. I uh, must have accidentally left it running or something. The song you just heard was called uh, Guard Down Remix of a song from Half-Life 2 Episode 1. You can easily find all these songs I've been playing just by doing Half-Life OST Remix. All very good takes on the game, the game's music. So I left off last time right before another pretty big fight sequence, so I'm going to be jumping right into some action. Making sure everything is running okay. And this is a spoiler zone. If you don't want to be spoiled about Half-Life Alex and all of that, um, the developer commentary talks about a lot of important plot points. I'll probably be talking about it. You're free to talk about Half-Life Alex specifically, uh, or just Half-Life storyline spoilers in chat. That's okay. Um, and I, I've been replaying this game just because I haven't had a new computer since the last time. Um, I played this, so it's cool to be able to play it at high graphical settings and all that. And it's also really cool to hear from the developers. So here you go. Make sure it's all running okay. Huh. Interesting. So I have it running at a higher field of view. And last time it added really big black bars around it when I did that, but now that I've reset the game... Um, it looks like the black bars are a lot smaller, so like it adjusted it automatically. So it's not as... the effect isn't as severe as it was before. Well, that's cool. And <laughs> this is how I ended the last stream. Just like a, a life skill that you may need uh, is learning how to, uh, you know, Tetris luggage into the trunk of your car. You never know. So now I gotta remember everything else. And when you see me looking at my left palm, it's, it means I'm looking at you, chat. There's a little triangle. Yeah, that is actually the nose. Because the viewports are circular. So that's like actually the nose point. You're looking through my right eye. So I'm like pointing right at you right now, which in VR, I'm pointing at my right eye. This is my left. You can't see, and then right. Yeah, how do I play this game again? Alright, so I got this. Oh yeah, and thank you for all the follows while I was out. Um, the Craven, thank you for the follow. Ocean Man, Lord Serenian, General Vane, Nyanlotep, Lemon Blazer, and thank you for the host, Elizarin, Doc Jackal too. Wait, Nyanlahotep. Wonder if you're related to what was it? Nyan Necromancer, or Necron, I don't know. There was someone with a similar name that was in here yesterday. Ah. Uh, and everything that happened, that may or may not have happened earlier, was not planned at all. I was just like, oh hey, I'm in VR, why not? It could have been a lot better and more interesting, but I wouldn't have done it if I sat around and planned it, so... Uh, just make shit up. 
How do I get in there? Oh yeah, I can teleport to go a little faster. I was looking at some of the mods that are available for Half-Life Alex, and one of them does add crowbar functionality. Ah. Wow. Yeah, like I was saying in my last stream, I that was the biggest thing that I wanted, because this is in VR. It's like, I want to be able to just pick things up and throw them. Like, take a chair and just throw it at a crowbar, or at a head crab. Three left. I'm a little over halfway through the game. Can't remember, it's been a while. So I have played through the whole game before. Oh. And this is hard mode as well. Grenade out, thanks for letting me know. Getting kind of crowded down here, Russ. Com channel's gone crazy. We took out that substation. They know we're out to the vault now. Whatever's in there, they really, really don't want us to have Well, now I just want to go. So now calm, Alex. I'm gonna try to do what I did last time I played this, which is to not fight this guy and just go around him. Oh, jeez. Uh, I'm gonna have to do this really quick. Uh. Steady. Hey, wait. <sighs> I think the door is too much of an obstacle for the wall hammer. Oh, interesting. I never noticed that these actually have, like, mixing devices on them. Alright. Well, he's allegedly proceeding with containment. Yeah, I'd love to play this in uh, multiplayer. Alright, here's some commentary. Trip mines have appeared in prior Half-Life games, and the act of defusing them seemed like a natural fit for a VR game where players can perform complex operations with their hands. By this point in the game, players have already learned how to hack combine technology with their multi-tool, but we wanted diffusing a trip mine to be more tense than the hacking puzzles. To diffuse a trip mine, not only does the player have to place their hand near the laser that could trigger the mine, but they have to perform the task within just a few seconds. Early versions of this puzzle were inspired by lockpicking, resembling a series of tumblers that the player had to quickly align. Unfortunately, the tumbler design required players to rotate their wrists in an uncomfortable manner, particularly given that they had to also avoid touching the laser beam. 
We removed the rotational component but kept the timing element, leading to the mechanic you see in the final game. We also experimented with causing the trip mines to actually explode if the player failed to defuse them, but most players found this too punishing, especially in cases where a chain reaction of explosions could occur. Instead, the mines just stay active and the player can attempt to defuse them again. We did end up keeping this behavior for the hard difficulty setting, but added a warning sound a few seconds before the mine actually explodes to give players some time to move away. We also experimented with allowing diffused mines to be removed and redeployed by the player, but we hadn't designed enough combat scenarios around this mechanic for it to be satisfying in practice. So this was left out of the final game. Nice. Guess I probably should inject the drug. Can't remember. Containments on visual. Contact in sector 9 or 4. Open echo on Alex. They know it's me. How do they know it's me? I guess echo squad are the low level grunts. The ones in the white. Be cool if you could reuse the mines. That would be cool. really love these sorts of spaces, these like residential blocks like this. One of my favorite areas just in the Half-Life world for some reason. I feel like I should visit Eastern Europe sometime in my life just so I can see this kind of architecture. <laughs> Not hesitating and being careful. Ten forty. Wait, do I have ten forty written down? Uh, I don't have 1040 in my list. Huh. I don't remember what that is. Oh my god, stop deploying them. Jerk. that solo active praying for sundown sundown means that he's 
giving up hope when the sun sets it means they're dead Forty. It's heavy casualties. Could be. Yeah, the man hacks have moth AI. This continuously crash in the windows. Look at this. Did you ever think you would find a right triangle laying around? You could actually sit here and be like, "Yep, looks good." Glasses. I dropped the commentary. This combat arena that loops back over itself as the player winds through the tenement buildings What's was one guy? of the earliest test maps built when we began adding combined soldiers to Half Life Alex. One of the lessons we learned from this series of combat encounters was that fighting combined soldiers was physically taxing on players as we needed to pay careful attention to pacing. Taking cover, reloading, switching weapons, and acquiring targets really pushed on all the skills that players had learned up until this point. To help cut down on fatigue, we added gaps between the combat encounters and removed some of the combat altogether to better pace the experience. The trip mines in the stairwell following this battle are a good example of one of the pacing elements we use to slow the player down and let them recuperate before the combat ramps back up again. Now, Corey, like I said last time, I appreciate your commentary, but please don't fry yourself so much. So hard to listen to. Hey, hey, I'm here to tell you about how uh, Half Life we can uh, we figure out how uh, you know the combine and we can do the uh, other thing. And... Oh. Tooth, toothpaste. Nice. It's it's like visual uh, ASMR, I guess. I can I can feel this. I can feel it on my fingers. Hmm. <laughs> the fry guy. Yeah. I notice in VR chat there's a lot of people that intentionally talk like that. And it's like, I know th the case of this person, he's probably just tired or I don't know. But a lot of times in, in VR chat, I'll come across people that think they just sound like really chill, really cool. Like just the lazier and more laid back you sound, the cooler you are. So you get these, as people call e-boys in VR chat to be like, yeah, what's up? And just chill and listen to music, you know, just, just, uh, just chilling out. As they sit in full body in front of the mirror, staring at them and petting their, like, anime girl. Pechini. Pechini. I think it's like tea? I don't remember. Pechini. Pechia. I'll pronounce it. Just like an innate human thing to just love like putting things and other things and closing doors and throwing plates hey that gives me an idea Let's see not quite uh oh. <laughs> Not quite. 
Oh, I think we're out of plates. Oh, hey. Like, I want to just export this little apartment area. And just make it its own map in Half-Life Alex, and then just, like, sit here and enjoy putting things away and organizing them. Like, just being like, alright, here's my VHS collection. And anyone watching me play for the first time, apologize in advance. There's a reason why this is a very long playthrough, and all my Half-Life Alex playthroughs are very long, because I just love fooling around in VR. Especially when there's physics involved like this. Here's my AHS collection. Yeah, let's just, uh, let's hang this on the wall, you know? Let's put this right up here. Perfect. Really satisfying little noise. Oh, what is this? Oh, I never saw this. Team Printer Company. Huh. Restauran Restaurant. Oh my god, there's even... What are these? Like hole punch things. How many little details? Half-Life Alex tidying mod, exactly. The last time I thought it'd be fun to have a viscera cleanup detail in Half-Life Alex. That would be really fun, actually. People that in VRChat, uh, but interactables don't have physics. Yeah, VRChat's physics are a little iffy. Look at all the things that Valve has to create to make environment this believable and fun to play in. I know, and some of the commentary was talking about that, how they said there was two very distinct play styles that they witnessed as people were playtesting Alex, was that uh, people who just want to get through the game and are engrossed in the story and just going room to room to room, and then people that would take huge amounts of time just looking at the environment and touching everything. And you can guess what party I fall in to. Even though I like the story and all that also. Wait a minute. This is not a pipe. Ses no slav blah blah peep. I don't know the phrase. Makes me sound like a, a an educated art historian. Not a pipe. Anyway. And our friend should be down there somewhere still. Oh, there he is. Hey! Mr. Wallhammer, I'm up here. Are they saying my name? Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> Funny thing is that all of the different types of Combine have that line, so they can all potentially be like, Alex! Alex, it's us! Help! Come save us, Alex. What is this? I do notice that this game does a lot more to humanize the Combine than the previous games. A lot more moments where they, the Combine soldiers just have like casual conversations. Salty Deer Games, thank you for the raid. I remember you host, or you raided me last time too, much appreciated. 
You just want to hang out, it's fine. It is pretty scary. Skinwalker combine, yeah. Hmm. Oh, yes. Wait, there's got to be something hidden over here, unless I got it already. I think I must have gotten it already. But in memory of Half-Life 2... Oh, I should have done it in the other room. With the TV sitting in one of the tenements in the beginning of the game, where you could just, like, throw the TV out the window. This area is of high interest to me. I'm going to try to take a lot of screenshots because my, uh, I might try making a little VR chat world of the infestation zones, um, since my Elix 6 character is an infestation control unit. And I, I know how to extract models and textures and sounds and stuff from the game and get them in the VR chat, so I was considering making a little, like, original world for, uh, hazmat folks to hang out in. Uh, yeah, with Gary's mod, you can play Half-Life 2 in VR. I mean, it's really janky and pretty laggy, so if you, if you aren't, um, if you don't have a particularly strong VR stomach, it's kind of hard to play, but I have a few videos of me playing the mod early on, and the pacing of trying to play Half-Life 2 in VR is really intense compared to Alex. And they even talk about that in one of the commentary nodes, as they say that, um... They tried originally just porting over some of Half-Life 2's combat and just doing it in VR, but it's so fast-paced and almost too much for you to try to try to do in VR uh, that they def they knew that they definitely had to slow down the combat. But it was actually really fun though when I played it. I might try doing that again, see if the mods improved at all. And I have a better computer now too, so it won't death, so it might not be quite as laggy. I love this, like, going between buildings like this. Whoops! No! I was taking a screenshot! I'll let the head crabs do their work. I guess they died pretty quick. Oh. Ow. But now I know when I take a screenshot, I gotta leave my gun closed, or my, uh, my hands on. Wait, is there soap? Bar of soap? All right. It was an interesting challenge for artists and level designers to employ environmental storytelling to paint a picture of what may have happened inside the walls of the quarantine zone. Just like the hotel, these apartments have been overrun by Zen foliage and are filled with people's belongings, abandoned in haste. In this area, the walls have been torn down, either by destructive portal storms or perhaps the Combine's cleanup effort. Barrels of fluid used by workers to try and treat or contain the Zen growth 
have been left behind and it would appear that the cleanup efforts have either failed or been abandoned. By not explaining every facet of the world, we leave players with the opportunity to imagine for themselves the bigger picture of life in City 17. I love that. All right, picture time, reference images. It's gonna be really hard just in Unity to try to re recreate the advanced lighting that's going on in here. I know there is a Unity plugin called Bakery that is has some pretty good looking um, light and shadow rendering kinds of things. But it's just big understatement, but it's just like lighting like makes the scene. Like you can have some really amazing looking models and stuff like that, but if it's not lit properly, it just does not look as good as it could. And at the same time, same time you could have some very low level detail uninteresting models but if it's lit just the right way it'll look amazing this is lighting is so critically important to any kind of like visual style of something i mean you can just see how like the lighting changes throughout here we go from like the natural light shining through the windows mixing with like the orange glow of everything and then uh half-life has a history of this where like orange and sun colors more associated with like rebels and the way the world was and then blue is associated with combine and kind of oppression so anywhere there's a lot of blue presence it's more uh the combine's presence being known I want to know what these machines are. Looks like it's just some sort of like power terminal or something. How that heartbeat sound here. That's right, I probably should be ready on the gun. Area gets a little intense. I like this lighting right here so good. And the volumetric fog as well. Gives the place sort of a... a uh, a lot more depth. Makes it feel a little suffocating. As you might imagine, this place probably does not smell very good. This tastes like. Hmm. Use me, sir. Have anything of use? Viscerator. Wish I could pick it up and use it. Ordinal is actually voiced by a woman, interesting enough. It's cool. We'd never guess based on how they sound. what's gonna happen here I gotta do something I did this in my other run of the game too where's that trash bin no oh, sorry I'm taking so long but I got I got things to do 
Where's the trash bin? I saw one here. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, of course, orange and blue are complementary colors, so it's just sort of a naturally appealing color pattern, I guess. Because the game might not do it for me. I'm going to save right here. Shoot, well, it's making me progress a bunch here. <laughs> but I think I was supposed to go into the basement first. <sighs> okay, let me go, 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 go. And I'll speed it up a little by putting this down. Oh jeez. There he is. Come back, come up here. He's like clipping through the ground like that. All right, let's do this. Oh! All right, let's try that one more time. good enough. But my previous run I got the I caught the head crab inside here, carried it around and like dumped him over the railing and it was really satisfying. Oh, he's coming back. You could just stay down there by the way. Oh. I love opening and closing doors in VR. Come on, latch. Okay, this heartbeat is getting annoying. You just hate that when your heart is beating too much and it just doesn't want to stop. Terrible. Reason for absence. Sick, death, personal time, vacation, government leave, maternity, holiday leave, no pay. Bench and injury. Unexcused other. It'd be funny if this form was filled out. got that data pod, right? I do. Russ, this thing's bio-coded. I'm gonna need the TLI. Yep, it's right over there. Okay, great. You good, honey? For sure. You go ahead. I'll be fine, Dad. I promise. Keep that promise. I'll get to work on the data pod. Come 
Come on, Mr. Hammer. Whoop. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, he's just knocking on the door like, Hello, anyone there? Hello? Oh, this was here the whole time? Well, I'll just leave him be. Some more really nice lighting. This is a very safe thing to just carry with you all the time. Oh yes, this part. Gonna walk in on an awkward situation. <laughs> Mom, I wasn't doing anything, I swear! Here we go. Whoa, you're strong. Once we had the spine of the game complete, teams went through the maps looking for additional opportunities to add the character and tone that players associate with the Half-Life games. This mannequin head grab was a fun opportunity to hit on the sci-fi horror B-movie vibe. We had a few conversations about how long to leave the head crab atop the mannequin, and decided that the experience should be analogous to catching a small dog in the middle of some mischief. <laughs> we wanted players to feel like they had walked in on something they weren't supposed to see. Oops. See, and for them to go away feeling like every inch of the game contained something for them to find if they chose to explore it. After an early update to the head crab sounds, where details like breathing and grunting were added for the first time, we received feedback that the new sounds were too cute and familiar moving the head crab too far in the direction of a cuddly creature rather than an alien threat. <laughs> we updated the sounds to be more threatening, but for this head crab, we brought back some of the cuter sounds to sell the head crab's frustration with the mannequin. Why are so many head crabs going through the ground? Uh, I don't remember where I'm supposed to go. Am I supposed to jump down there? Oh, I probably am. <laughs> Inner Evil, if you have that clip, you could just post it in chat. I wonder how they recorded the, the cute and cuddly head crab sounds. Is it just somebody going like, and then they modified it or something? Oh, I noticed, like when I was watching the making of uh, Dead Space. It's that way more sounds, even like inorganic things, were created starting just from a person going like, uh, uh, and then they modify it like a ton, turn it into whatever else. In order to reduce the amount of reloading required in the heat of battle, Yo, it's we wanted players to be able to upgrade the pistol by increasing its ammo capacity. 
That might seem like a small change, but implementing it in a way that was intuitive to players and that didn't have a lot of negative side effects was surprisingly tricky to get right. Our initial mechanic for increasing the ammo capacity was to use double-sized clips. Once the pistol was upgraded, the player's backpack held clips with twice as many bullets, and those were represented by a clip model that was twice as long. But unfortunately, the longer clips presented a lot of distracting fictional problems. For one, they looked ridiculous protruding out of the bottom of the pistol. Players were also left wondering what was going on in their backpack to transform the single capacity clips that they put in there into the double capacity versions that they were pulling out. We were also left with the sort of absurd implication that the pistol clips found in the world now magically all had to be the upgraded double-sized versions. And while we did scrap the double-sized clips, the concept was still enticing. We just needed to find a better metaphor. So then we started looking at the hoppers that were used on paintball guns that can store large amounts of paintballs. In fact, the final upgrade that resulted from this whole line of thinking is still internally referred to as the bullet hopper. So with this in mind, we next needed to design an intuitive interaction model. Players were already satisfied with our existing pistol interaction loop, which was eject clip, insert the next one, magazine, chamber, and then shoot. So we wanted to preserve these skills that players were already beginning to master. So players would still reload the gun as before, but small mechanical prongs would steal bullets from the inserted clip, pull them into the hopper, and then place them into the firing chamber as needed. Audio cues were also added to clearly communicate the state of the hopper loading process. The hopper also impacted the visual design that we used to convey the state of the pistol. Originally, the clips themselves had a numerical counter indicating the number of bullets remaining. And on its own, this was fine, and players understood it easily. But the readout on the bullet hopper was on the opposite side of the pistol, and had a pattern of blue dots indicating the amount of bullets remaining. So these two representations in two different locations made it difficult for players to quickly determine the total number of bullets in the upgraded gun. To solve this, we designed a single visual readout on the side of the pistol grip. It structurally matched the state of a pistol clip, the pistol's bullet chamber, and the bullet hopper if the upgrade was acquired. Nice. I don't know, Greg is one of the original Valve employees, too. He's been there since Half-Life 1. His name is on the lockers in Black Mesa. And of course his name became a joke later on because of memers. Memers are the real threat to everyone's dignity. I don't think there's anything else I want to upgrade. I don't want burst fire or laser sight. don't want, well I don't even have enough, but I don't want laser sight on this. I guess auto loader could be nice, but eh, I'm good with what I have. Yeah, Greg Coomer, it's middle school all over again, yeah. Yeah, a lot of these, um, a lot of the puzzles that you do in VR, like they s made them specifically to be VR oriented, meaning like depth perception is important. 
And I remember watching people play the desktop hack for HL Alex and trying to do the puzzles with mouse and keyboard, and it looked like next to impossible to do. Actual footage of being an, uh, an anime girl avatar in a public black cat world VR chat as a, on a Friday when the Universal Union team is invading worlds. I love the sound of all the vortigaunts in these like coffin things. You can hear the the vortessence. Speak like an orchestra. Ah. Or a chorus, I should say. That's right, this is really tricky. Seem okay? Oh, he, he's fine, Alex. He's working away over there. Good. Well, thanks. Oh, he is missing a leg, though. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was missing a leg before. Right. Well, it's it's still gone. Thanks, Russ. Sure thing. Nice. Sit rep seven twelve fourteen. Situation report. But I'd love if there was some kind of thing being shown on the TVs. Oh yes. Practicing being careful with bottles for later. No particular situation, just, you know. Tommy. Nice to see you around. Yeah, it's funny how you can just act instinctively in VR and it like it it works for you. 
Um, like my, my, uh, against my better judgment, I have my wrist straps dangling right now. And when I was putting my hand over here, I was like, oh shoot, my wrist strap is going to get caught on this shelf as I reach over here. I guess there is stuff on the TV screens. Alright, very careful lock picking. Whoops, gotta listen for all the pins, put my ear right up to it, and... <laughs> Perfect. This is lock picking lawyer, and here today... I'm in City 17, with this Master Lock 432, very disappointing. I opened it with some, some bubble gum, foil, hold it over twice. Big click out of one, two, three. Remember, coming up here is a really cinematic moment. Oh, speaking of which, I see you, Artistic Vista, coming up. Phoenix Overlook that, when I first played this game, lagged my game to death. I couldn't enjoy it very much, but I want to check over here real quick. Enjoy brick. Oh, I just can't get away from it. Great, now why is there two ways out here? Oh, Alex! Are you seeing that? The Vortigons are taking down the substation! Yes! Chris, this is my work! Deploying technician teams, two blocks, four lines, six blocks, three blocks. Technician team? Sounds like something Helix would do. Wait, now what was the other overlook? Now I gotta go back and not get eaten by this barnacle. Oh, it was a spoiler overlook, okay. But yeah, I'm getting solid 90 FPS here. Previous computer could not handle this. Beautiful. Light as a feather. little janky with the continuous motion. I could just twist these and make a pipe burst somewhere else as a distraction. And Mirror's Edge has taught me that I can climb this. I can feel the smooth coated pipe paint Stacking boxes, always fun in VR. Never gets old. Especially with the physics as good as 
Alex's. Oh yes, I'm back. You hear that suppressor outside. Getting ready to suppress. True, the pipes had no pressure. I wish I had that thing where, you, where other senses fill in the gaps with VR. It just doesn't happen with me. Well, I mean, there's people that say phantom sense. I kind of romanticize the notion, but there is... I don't know, if you really let your mind... Let your mind go... I feel like you can have kind of an enhanced feeling if you kind of are more of a relaxed state. I don't know. I always think when I when it's raining in a game and I look straight up, I can feel the raindrops hitting my face. Especially the way, Alex, this game doesn't let your hands go through objects very much. Like, this really gives an enhanced feeling. I kind of feel like I'm actually touching this compared to if it just clipped straight through. Come on. Ah! This dramatic lighting, is it setting something up? Tools, whoops. Sounds like a dangerous situation out there, I better be prepared. Alright. Almost. Alex. It was a close fight. Oops. Yeah, I fixed him real good. Oops. All right, I'll go quickly to catch up. It's generally a requirement that all new enemy types have a section of the game designed to introduce them. We rarely build the introduction early on in the process though, because it's often through playtesting that we learn exactly what aspects of the new enemy need to be highlighted in the introduction. In addition to understanding the capabilities of a new enemy, we also find introductions help solidify the very existence of the new enemy type in the player's mind. Without an explicit introduction, we sometimes find that playtesters confuse multiple enemy types, conflating them in their minds. This was the case with the Suppressor, the class of soldier that's designed to pin a player behind cover while other soldiers advance on them. The Suppressor is an inversion of the previous soldier classes, who've all focused on trying to push players out of cover. The Suppressor introduction stretches across the next two rooms. In the first, players see the Suppressor firing at zombies, giving the player a moment to safely observe its firing behavior. They also get to hear its associated sounds, which are important to learn for future encounters. In the second room, players learn to fight the Suppressor themselves. 
This is relatively straightforward when the suppressor is alone, but will become more involved in later arenas where we combine the suppressor with other soldier types. Nice. Magic. Ripcord on APF. APF is abbreviation for the suppressor's code name. Wait, 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 let me... APF is Antibody Protection Force. Which is a kind of a, a weird acronym to unwrap. A Antibody Protection Force. So I guess the Combines see themselves as antibodies going around fighting infections and fighting malignant infection infestations as in the undesirable humans on this planet and other things but they see themselves as protecting fellow antibodies so they call themselves the APF I guess first time I played this game I was trying to flick things off off the floor in real life for weeks yeah oh yeah I was definitely doing this sort of like like yoink I was doing that in things in real life and I was just like doing it several times in a row. I was just like, what? Why isn't it working? Stupid game's broken. Oh, he left. Ooh. Oh. Look at that lighting. Or workers. I still have my full body trackers on from earlier. Condition shadow. What does condition shadow mean? I think it's uh if they if they call for shadow if they're going to retreat and hide, I think. So they're saying that they're afraid of their situation, so they are hiding in the shadows or something? I can't remember. Oh, I remember this part. I'll let the su I'll flatter the suppressor and make him feel really cool about what he's gonna do here. But let me grab the useful stuff first. Oh no, don't break all these things. Damn, you're so tough. Try it again. Whoa. I'm really scared of you. How about over here? This glass will protect me. Calling me a low value target. Wait, come back. Refill an APF. Alright. <laughs> he said I'm compliant because I haven't fought back yet. 10108. Let me check what code 10108 is. 
Uh, 10107 is suspicious behavior. I don't know what 10108 is. Dang it, I gotta look all these up eventually. Take. Biodat upload. All the combine have biometric data chips that report their vital signs to the Overwatch. So when they update their biodat, it means that they're like letting the, the bigger Overwatch force know um, know what their condition is. All right, what do I have available here? Target is hostile. I haven't done anything to you. Empty dagger. <laughs> Extended conflict, meaning that this fight is taking too long. <laughs> He's insulting me. Loud contaminants. I'm a I'm a I'm a contaminant. Loud means they're uh, fighting back. Oh god. Do not shoot. Compliance confirmed. Does it look like I'm complying? Oh. Ooh. Okay. 10-108 is in danger. Interesting, because 10-8 means on duty. And... 1099, no, 1199 means like in critical danger. Does he haven't shot back all his bio that simply is heart rate increase. Very useful, right? I want to push buttons, give me more buttons. Now, suppressor is based on an old, old concept art for what the original Combine were supposed to look like. Oops. So it's really cool to see it realized uh, in full glory. Come on. Huh. His eyes are still on. It has, like, these really wide lenses. Because they're, like... It extended peripheral vision because suppressor is meant to be able to overlook an entire area and know exactly where all the targets are hiding from like a like a macro level but yeah the combine were originally designed to look kind of like this um in half-life 2 i don't remember what this big thing is supposed to be here I love the, like, texture of the armor. Like, I want to see what this feels like. You have this, like, interesting armor piece on the back that the other ones don't have this kind of thing. I wonder what this would be for. Oh, that's, like, ammunition inside there, huh? Yeah, 11.99 offer. Officer requires immediate assistance. Okay, there's no direct path from where you are to the vault, so you're going to have to snake your way there. Well, it's huge, so it shouldn't be hard to know which way I'm going. I don't understand what they're doing with it here. If this weapon is so powerful, why keep it locked up in a dump like this? My guess is they're trying to find a way to ship it off Earth, back to their home or some other planet. Why not use it here? 
They already won this war, Alex. It's true. I like situations in games where you've already lost and you're just trying to make do with what's already here, kind of like Final Fantasy VI. It's kind of boring to me when it's like, oh, it's a fight. You either win or you lose. I like reconciliation, just sort of a, how can we make the best of what's available? It isn't practical to spend development time or art resources evenly across every part of the game, so we rely on strategic reuse of resources to maintain fidelity and specificity across the game's environments. This space was initially constructed using industrial models and textures seen throughout many previous environments. To set it apart, we added the large cables and vortigaunt pods to imply a makeshift combine power plant whose purpose was to transmit energy to the substations. The juxtaposition of this abandoned industrial space with the large combine cables created enough visual interest to make the space feel meaningful at a relatively low cost. The cable motif was subsequently added to other parts of the game to increase visual interest and give the player a sense of being led toward the vault. It may not be obvious, but the cables exiting through the ceiling here continue on to the exterior of the building, across the large construction courtyard, and over the roof of the distillery building, presumably continuing on to a substation or other combine infrastructure. Players may not notice that continuation, but such details help guide us in building a world that feels connected and consistent. I love that. Uh, because my health is so low, the controllers are actually vibrating at the rate of the heartbeat, so it sort of feels like my own pulse is being felt through the controllers right now. Oh, hi. Barnacle tongue. Got a snack for you. Here you go. Where's the other one? All right, let's do this two at once. Easy. Oops. Oh, this part. Save. Oh, yeah, that could have been a back brace in the back of the suppressor because of all the recoil of the gun. Oceans are being drained, wildlife is being extinguished, there's anti-fertility field, preventing repopulation. It's really dystopian for sure. I know, that's kind of the thing, anyone who really likes the Half-Life series is well aware of air exchange was a huge part of Half-Life 2's original design. It was going to be an entire scene of the game, kind of like the Borealis, but it was scrapped. But air exchange is supposed to be this like gigantic power plant looking thing that was in charge of altering the, uh, the chemical structure of the Earth's atmosphere. And it was going to fe feature these enormous smokestacks that were just like billowing out all kinds of weird combined chemicals into the atmosphere an attempt to, like, suffocate out all of Earth and to make Earth more hospitable hospitable to a different species other than human. 
It was a really cool idea, but it was never fully realized. Get a load of this guy. Hi. So, both of the lenses are out. So, like, Combine's soldiers' eyes are the lenses that go into them. The, like, mechanical lenses. Kind of like over here. Oh, no, this guy is missing. Wait, does he have... Oh, yeah, he has... He has one... Ugh. Well, he has one missing eye, and then a lens in the other, so it's like... This creature cannot exist without its technology. It's just like a bunch of meat as a base, and then all the tech put into it. The only way that it can exist. Ooh. So warm. Play uh, Surgeon Sim right now. Gonna g save your life, give you a full heart transplant. Not too late. Give you CPR. Must make 10, 11, 12. Pretty hard. I don't remember what that is. There's too many 10 codes. And the, actually the dialogue of Half-Life 2's uh, civil protection is probably the most elaborate and full of lingo compared to any other unit and throughout Half-Life Alex too. Like if you go on YouTube, someone has like a huge collection, an example of a of dialogue exchanged between the Metro Police or the Civil Protection Officers, and there's just there's like a whole other story unfolding just within the chatter on the radio, and it all makes sense, and it's all responding to what's going on in the game. It's just an amazing attention to detail. All the codes and everything aren't just jargon, like they actually have meaning in everything as well. That's really cool. Stuck down there. Good luck. Don't dead open inside. Yeah. <laughs> oh, throwing stuff at me. Uh oh. That was a mistake. Big mistake. All right.
See, I want to be able to just use this as a weapon. Odds in Costco. Check engine. Oh yeah, we still have the closet dude. But I have a special plan for closet dude. Yeah, it is soldier from TF2. Or engineer, because he's wearing a construction helmet. Alright, you can come out. This way, sir. Wait, well, you have something on you. Let me grab that real quick. Not that. Oh, no, 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 not that. Okay, we're gonna have to take you this way first. Something in your pocket. Let me have that. Ah. Pliers. Wow, some he heavy pliers. Ooh. Come on. They help me, oh god. Well, I'm helping you right now. You have been helped. Give me your ammo! There it is. There's nothing even in here? And I have to listen to my heartbeat again, I guess. God damn it. Could I have skipped this whole sequence? I just went right through here. Wait. Oh, that's where I came from. Oh, that was here the whole time? Oh my god. Where am I even trying to go? Fortunate series of events. Oh! <laughs> Cardboard, please. Stuck! Oh my god, it's actually stuck in my hand. There. <laughs> Cardboard's a very dangerous thing to use. I'll be right with you.
hate that orange light. No, I wasted a bullet. All that for one piece of resin? Oh. Is a sticky fly trap. I don't know if that zombie died by getting hit by a hammer. Why can't I do that to other things? I want to hit things with hammers. Oh, I can't use barnacles either. I don't think you can get up the step. Shooting at odd angles instead of always using this. Just using your own depth perception and just using instinct to shoot. But as Dr. Breen told us, Instinct, like superstition, must be expunged. Instinct rises up against us. No, what does he say? Oh, something about instinct. There's probably more ammo and stuff up there, but I'm already this close. One problem we faced with the VR movement styles that Alex supported was keeping the combat experience from diverging based upon whether players were using teleport or continuous movement. If the combat was significantly different depending on the player's movement setting, our playtesting requirements could explode combinatorially. combinatorially. One way that we prevented this combinatorial explosion was by ensuring that AIs could sense player movement no matter which locomotion style the player was using. To do this, we created a visual proxy for players using teleport locomotion. Imagine a scenario where the player is behind cover, hidden from a soldier's sight. If the player used continuous movement to run to another piece of nearby cover, the soldier would see them while they were out in the open. But a player who instantly teleported from one piece of cover to the next would not be seen. To solve this discrepancy, when a player teleports, we leave a breadcrumb trail of invisible visual proxies, oh. which the enemy AI can see. These proxies pass information to the AI, similar to what it would have gathered from seeing the player perform the movement directly. In this case, the soldier would know the teleporting player had left the original cover and run across open ground to the new cover, just like a player using continuous motion. While obviously not identical, in that the soldier didn't have a chance to take a shot at the teleporting player, these kinds of features did allow us to reduce the number of ways our AI logic needed to take player movement options into consideration. It's really interesting. Also, look at the bird. It's the first time I've seen a bird just holding still in this game. Actually, I think there was a pigeon at the very beginning that I almost grabbed. Crow friends are best friends. Also, I remember I have to plug these controllers in. So I'm going to have to sit for a bit. the USB cables are too short. God, and it's nice having USB Type-C. I don't even have to look at the controller to plug these in. It's great. Whereas the micro USB, the Vive controllers, I would sit there flipping the thing back and forth. 
back and forth forever. You've got company. Boy, this is gonna be a fun fight with no health. Hold up, y'all. Hold up. Thank you. Outbreak is uncontained. Clearing sight lines. Oh, jeez. Too bad. That was just the tutorial. Teach you that, alright, here is the role that the suppressor will play during combat. He died sitting upright. It's almost like a rhythmic game now, rhythm game, because they got the suppressor coming in on one consistent beat, and they got the wall hammer coming in on its own rhythm. I love how you can hear the shots ricocheting off the wall behind me. Oh my god. This is getting too close. Sneaky guy with his shield. Oh, geez. Winding me a little bit. B. 
Vidya Bum, thank you for the raid. Survival mark engaged. What the hell is the suppressor doing back there? Yo, what are you doing? Oh, he's executing full response, alright. Take a piss. And like I always say, definitely recommend following Vidya Bum in chat there. We stream at similar times, except he streams significantly more times than I do. Very late night people. He streams a lot of horror stuff. Occasionally Monstrum, Tarkov. And uh spooky stuff watching movies and things like that. Lamb VR, thanks for the follow. Critical error streams. Thank you for the follow as well. Oops, my chat overlay is a little messed up. All right, suppressor. Ooh, I like some of the combine language written on this, like, ammo thing here. I think this is ammunition. Kind of looks like it. Tell me what you know. What's in the vault? Uh, we're heading towards the Disney vault up here to see uh, what sort of movies are put away there for good. And also to find Walt Disney's frozen head is also hidden inside the vault. I'm gonna take a look at that. Excuse me, sir. Could I borrow this from you? Thank you. Soundscape, some of my favorite touches, uh, details put into games are the soundscapes. For Half-Life Alex, we wanted to expand the functionality of our soundscape system, which is used to play ambient sounds. In prior games, we could generally only play one soundscape at a time. The player would be hearing either soundscape A or soundscape B, with a brief crossfade from one to the other. In this game, the soundscapes are much more flexible and can be overlapped in ways that enable more realistic transitions. For example, the volume of different soundscapes can be controlled by the player's position and the open or closed state of particular doors in the world. We frequently use this functionality in areas like this transition between indoor and outdoor spaces. If you pause outside for a moment, you'll notice the crickets, birds, distant dog barks, and other environmental sounds that help paint the picture of the quarantine zone late in the day. As you move into the indoor area, you'll notice the outdoor soundscape diminish as you move away from the door. Nice. In fact, if you close the door, the volume of the outdoor soundscape is reduced even further. I love that detail. And as you progress into the building, you'll begin to notice the indoor soundscape consisting of the indistinct hum of machinery and buzz of electrical fixtures. I want that guy to narrate an entire book on tape for the Half-Life universe. That was like the perfect person that they chose to explain the subtleties of sound design. Yeah, Bambi 2 might be hidden in the Disney vault up there. And also for everybody joining right now, this is a spoiler stream. Because I have played this game through multiple times. I know it's going to happen and all that. I was playing through with the developer commentary and that I have a new computer. Uh, I'm able to play it in high graphics settings for the first time. So, if you don't want the game spoiled, I recommend not watching. 
because uh, the, the the commentary talks about spoilers. I probably will occasionally. People in chat might occasionally. So just a warning. So let's let's witness what the commentary was just talking about. But right now you can hear distant birds, kind of the uh, the repeating sounds of the machines of these buildings operating. I think I can even hear like the air conditioner, whatever these things are here, and zombie moan apparently. And I can hear some like bugs buzzing on this side, so I'll open the door. And I will not be getting on the floor. So as I move inside. Suddenly a little bit Oh, you gotta ruin it. No, don't! Don't do it! Oh, a tragedy. I can still kind of hear the outdoors. And then when I close the door. Now we're like fully immersed into this new environment. Oh no, I need to sneeze. Can I mute the mic in time? Success. Outside sounds diminish a lot more, and you'd think when going through the door. They do. I mean, you kind of got to push the contrast between effects in a video game to make them noticeable. play the rest of the game like this. This is a reference to an actual Russian propaganda poster. This is NYET. And it's very important that everybody knows that this is N E T or uh, N Y E T. It is not HET. You filthy Americans, it's Nyet. And he's like, no. But the, the picture that it's referencing online is like a very uh, distinguished looking gentleman has like a wine glass on the table and he has his hand out saying no. Say no to alcohol. Oh. I bet I can get my stream banned if I just make make the uh, thumbnail this, if I just sit and look at it long enough. Green band. Just keep this over here. Ragdoll physics still a little wacky. Let's put the other one in there too. It's like they were friends. Aw, see? They, they got each other's backs. Head crabs can really get ahead in life. Alright, where am I going? Oh, this is where I'm going. Alright, don't try this at home, kids. Wow, I'm weak. Come on, game. There we go. Fifty-eight 
feels so good in VR. Yeah, my hands are fine. It hurts just to watch, <laughs> I know. See? But if I had just grabbed this and just yoinked it out, it would have fallen straight for the trap. These puzzles are also very difficult to do in the desktop hack of the game. They're so reliant on depth, and if you fail, it blows up and kills you, so... Nice. Much more punishing. Beautiful lighting. All that volumetric fog, tasteful use of bloom. Little god rays as it goes through the fence. crate silently falls to the ground. Come on. Light as a feather. Um, was I not supposed to go down here? Ah. again. Yeah, they did a good job making heavy objects feel a heavy. This is definitely a reference to some of the puzzles in Half-Life 1. This room's completely filled with trip mines and explosive things. God, if I had a gigantic track space, I would love to be able to just like walk freely through these and actually have to like bend over and duck and things like that. I'd rather be ducking than goosing. That was an accident because I pressed teleport instead of uh, rotate my hand. Bump the joystick. Well, now you know how that goes. The lovely room of death. Really easy to accidentally push the teleport thing with the index controllers. Oh, 
Okay. Love that sound. Like, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. Ah, inject it straight into the multi tool. Half the building would have been leveled after that this explosion. Ah. All this resin that I'm not going to use. Yes. Ah, even more. And some more. Oh, the resin does emit light. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I love that. Never noticed. This is actually a good demonstration of the big difference in gameplay between how this sort of puzzle is approached in a VR game compared to Half-Life 1, where that puzzle was really just a bunch of running and jumping and crouching at just the right time. For Half-Life Alex. And uh, then in VR, it was more about just precisely using your hands in places. It wasn't all that difficult, but it was satisfying. I feel like I'm gonna have a health container coming up pretty soon, so save that. Oops. Probably, I see there's some resin over there, but I don't really need resin. I think my controllers are charged enough for me to stand up again. Because I'm going to need to... Well, actually, I want to get into the running and gunning. Because in VR, it's just so much more satisfying. Alright. Also, let me know if my microphone ever gets really shitty sounding all of a sudden. Because I have a XLR coupler thing in my pocket. And sometimes when I move around a lot, it gets put in a weird position where it disconnects slightly and everything just sounds like static. Yeah, the shotgun auto loader. I don't know if I really want that because I like reloading the shotgun. I think it's fun.
Don't just say combine chatter. Tell me what they're saying. Radio's clear. Okay, I guess this isn't that type of game. Sector is not secure. Actually, I probably could have ran through most of this and avoided fighting him. You gotta learn to not shoot right into a wall. I swear, that's gonna. That's like the biggest oops challenge for me is remembering to, to pull the slide back. Like you just hit okay. B and it does it automatically. I don't see a way oh. to this building, so I'm gonna look around. What is this place anyway? It's a distillery. They made vodka and things like that. Is vodka good? Oh God, no. Russell doesn't like vodka. Got it. Well, I I never said that. But it's not good. It's poison. But but I love it. Everyone everyone loves it. Okay, that's all very confusing. Let me figure out how to get in, and then I'll find you some. Wonderful if you. Actually, yes. Huh. Alcohol, am I right, guys? Um, wish the game had a little bit more stealth. Yeah, maybe Alex doesn't understand the chatter either. Well, part of her role before the game started was she was reconnaissance and would be sitting and like listening to combine radio chatter. So I feel like that's part of her skill set is understanding what they're talking about. Um, wait, wait, missing what someone said way back up. Uh, carried a bucket through the entire game for most recent playthrough and store everything I find a little annoying but super helpful. I really like those kinds of like creative playthroughs like that. Like I know Great Sphinx 
someone you, a lot of you probably know, he played through a lot of the game. He had just carrying a bucket full of hand grenades. Because when they first introduce you to hand grenades, they give you like 10. And that's more than you really need for the sections. So we just stored them all and carried a bucket of grenades around through most of it. Um, if you can go out of bounds if you know how to. Uh, probably. I mean, VR is like notoriously easy to break if you actively try to. Uh, you think a speedrun would be vomit-inducing with all the teleporting you'd be doing? Not really. I mean, that's the thing, is not everybody is affected by VR sickness. It's just that it seems like it's more widespread than it really is, because you people who do who it hits them especially bad, you hear more about those people than a lot of people who it's just not a problem for them. So I'm sure there's people that can easily do it. Um... There is like you should you guys should watch the VR speedrun of Super Hot. Now that is intense to watch. And he has like a, a camera facing him as he does it too. It's really funny. Like getting your full body into a speedrun of something is funny to watch. Wonder if the dialogue changes when you bring the vodka bottle with you through the entire level. There is like an achievement, I believe, for if you carry well little spoiler but if you bring a bottle of vodka with you all the way through the level because russell's like hey you should bring a bottle home with or home with you or something like that and if you do it he just like thanks you or something i can't remember it's not that big of a difference but i uh, kind of want to hear uh kind of weird to make her out to be a kid that doesn't understand what vodka is but then have her murder an army yeah i mean that's just i guess kind of the weird situation that she's in is that she was born into the world of Half-Life. She doesn't know a world before the, uh, before the Resonance Cascade. Because she was like, what did we determine? She's like three years old or something when the Resonance Cascade happened. Which, you know, caused portal storms. Which means that all of the alien life was invading Earth. So that's been her whole life. So there's never been any non-chaos. You gotta learn to not shoot straight into sandbags. How embarrassing. Hey, open up. Licking toilets might be unhealthy. Might be. Still kind of hard to believe this is genuinely the first time she runs into an old bottle of vodka. Yeah. Also considering this takes place in Eastern Europe. Prevalence of alcohol, especially vodka, has got to be everywhere. Even says, vodka. Sistema. I am going to get a full health restoration in a second here, so let's save that. Come on, game. How is this not breaking the monitor? Oh, that's even worse. Come on. Kind of musical. Whoa, where'd it go? 
<laughs> yeah, it's like the Half-Life 1 crowbar, exactly. Come on. Oh no! Ha. Now this is satisfying, digging through a box of stuff. Like, no, no. Uh, let's just uh, put that over here. And there we go. Gently set it down. <laughs> Breaks anyway. Oh, I had to do that quicker. Here, have some dish soap. Alright, now... Now let's go get a full heal. Oh, I forgot this is here too. Oh, but I need this. Tricky game. Man, being a hacker is easy. One pistol mag? Amazing. Yeah, so this isn't going to work right now. Love the moving parts. I have to power the station. So let me go back up here. Well, I'll just take this one to be safe. If I can take at least one hit. Oh, it's already almost 4 a.m. here? Oh, well. Hmm. Yeah. This is the Combine Hacking Lawyer. Today, we're hacking into an ammunition box. Embarrassingly low security. Just had to move a red dot or a blue dot to another blue dot, and I already have access to ammunition. Um, definitely, someone should mod in tank that you can control with these levers. Okay. I'm trying to remember what, what you do here. Ah, yes. Love the looks of these kinds of rooms, these electrical rooms. See how quickly I can. Oh! Oh my god, I didn't know you could do this. I can smell the soap. Amazing. Alright, just hold up, alright?
Ah, uh, back. Forgot about that. I got the drone up and running again. Ignore that. We'll meet you outside. <laughs> Looks as if there are combined barricades up ahead. Uh. They're stopping anyone from getting any closer to the vault. Okay. So, what do you think? Make your way into the distillery and see where it takes you. With my drone back online, we've finally got the affair oh, on! No, you're kidding me! Oh, Jesus. Oh, you sneaky. Thanks for waiting. Oh my god, he's coming up fast. Oh god. Terrifying footstep sounds. That works. Grub friend. Whatever's left of you. Oh, geez. about cheating, teleporting. I need to preserve my ammo better. down here. Do not shoot. Sorry, my bad. Whew. Man, I want your gun. Oh. Alex? Alex, you still there? 
Man, the Ordinal's gun is so much more powerful. <laughs> okay, I love the design on the wall hammer. Loud footsteps. Oh man, all the way up here. Alright, I'll have to pick up the pace a little. Sneaky, sneaky. Very smart. Uh oh. Oh, fuck. Ladders. For our teleport and continuous locomotion modes, we provide corresponding ladder climbing methods. By default, player using teleport locomotion can target a ladder and after a oh. short timer, get teleported to the top or the bottom, depending on where they started. The timer was necessary to ensure that players were intentionally using the ladder. We didn't want them to unintentionally target the ladder and become disoriented when they found themselves at the other end. Players using continuous locomotion can directly grab ladders to climb up or down. In this mode, they can grab a ladder rung and move their hand down to raise their body or move their hand up to lower it. This allows players to move up or down the ladder rung by rung in a natural way. This mode turned out to be so popular that we added it as an option even for players using teleport locomotion. Nice. As it happens, most of the ladders in our game do not extend very far beyond the upper landing area. This made dismounting the top of a ladder challenging for players using continuous ladder climbing since there is very little ladder to grab onto above the landing area. To solve this, we detect when the player stops holding the ladder with both hands and automatically teleport them to either the top or the bottom based on the direction they were climbing. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of explicit ladder training in the game. So some players are surprised by this teleport behavior if they accidentally let go with both hands while climbing. Nevertheless, this was a better alternative to leaving the players hanging or forcing them to fall down if they let go with both hands, especially since some of our ladders are rather long and it would be tedious to have to reclimb just because a player happened to let go shortly before reaching the top. What's up, monkey tennist? Monkey ten oh, I guess I am climbing ladders. Welcome, maybe a replicant. Concept of being able to use one hand for healing and one hand for shooting is cool. That is one of the best things about... I mean, one really good thing about VR, anyway, is how extremely good VR is at shooting guns. And it just so happens to be that shooting guns is, like, the pastime, number one pastime of gamers everywhere. So just being able to do more than just move around like this and then be like, okay, aim. You know, this sort of thing. Just being able to move freely, look over here, aim this way, look, aim separately, hold on to thing, do thing. And there's even a mod that gives you the uh, wall hammer's big shield. You could bring the shield up to block bullets and then move up close and shoot and stuff like that. It's just shooting is something that is just inherently very satisfying, convincing in VR. Oh, that's right. Wait, 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 wait. 
more pistola. Ah. Oh, okay, all the power is back online, so I gotta do all this business. Okay. Let me go back over there. Yeah, blind firing too, just being able to just like be around the corner shooting. Yeah, mono is monkey in Spanish, which is very unfortunate for me, but I don't know, monkeys are, are pretty cool, so I'm not going to complain. Uh, I don't really want to upgrade my guns anymore, so I'm not even going to touch the machine, so oops, let's just do this. Okay, where am I going? Definitely not going to run into that barnacle while doing this puzzle. Okay. to go over here. Oh, did they, okay. Zen Clam? I didn't know they had names. Guess they're just jamming out with their clam out. only complain with controls and Alex is that you're locked into a, a gesture when trying to pick up anything. I want to be able to pick up a pen or a bullet with just thumb and index finger. Uh, you can, kind of. Right now I'm only holding uh, my index finger down. My other fingers, like, see, like, watch when I let go. Only my index finger was gripping that. I mean, it doesn't look like it, but I don't know. I think it's more satisfying using your whole palm to grab things. Actually, is there a third one of these? Oh, wait, there's three of these. Let me try something. Oh, by the way, for anyone who somehow has not seen the water physics or the bottle physics, Actually, this bottle doesn't demonstrate it the best, but... Yeah, this one doesn't work very well. 
Uh-oh. Um... Got it going for a little bit. Let me get these other things out of the way so I don't accidentally grab them. Ah! And I was able to juggle in um, Job Simulator. No! It's a little trickier with the index controllers because I have to actually grip. Well, actually, wait. No, okay, I'll just do it like this. There we go. Alright, well, you just all have to believe me that I can juggle. Put the bucket on my head. Is this a, a wearable bucket? Oh, it is. Nice. Well, now no one can... I'm invulnerable. No one can shoot me. Just wear this. Every prop is so detailed, I can't wait for the future of any more games as level of immersion and interactivity. I know Alex, Half-Life Alex, really sets the bar for detail in VR and games in general. Uh, you're talking about how hard it is to buy a, a good graphics card. The only way I was able to get my 3060 was by going to a real-life location and not buying online. I was just paying attention to the stock that my local Best Buy had. And they had a restock, and I wasn't even, like, sitting there F5-ing like crazy. I just got notified, went online, and it said it was in-store only deal ordered it in store and just went and picked it up like it was nothing whereas all of the online orders immediately were stolen or not stolen but just taken thanks for the follow nintendo dingus uh, maybe that's not all the way. I think I just have to put it halfway in between, so then I can jump across. Stealth games in VR. Yeah, there is a game called, um... Uh... Whatever that really old... Like, one of the original VR games where you use that portal technology. Not portal, but the VR ones where you use the portals to teleport around. That was like a stealth game in VR. Green shots. Just noting infestation related imagery. Man, I want a combine tarp. Combine logo on it. Dude. And this says CMB. Okay, more photography here. It really should just add a, like, in-game camera that you can whip out to take screenshots. It should detect when you're gesturing like, th like this. And it would just automatically take a screenshot.
budget cuts. Yeah, that's the game. Love the way to teleport through something that worked. Don't uh, pedal through and then move through if you want to go. Yeah, I want to meet the combine designer grub that made the logos and everything. I know. Like I was saying, like the combine must have hired a really good graphic designer. Like this enslave. The first thing they did was enslave graphic designers everywhere to create their whole identity on Earth. I just noticed like there's even pools of liquid that dripped onto these garbage bags. It's like I, I know exactly how this bag feels emotionally. No, but like the tactily. Oh god, glitchy hand. My hands are all sticky with uh with antlion blood, actually. You're all gonna love this part if you uh, if you haven't played the game before, you're in for a treat. And I know someone in chat skipped this part because it was too intense. Maybe it's like with Superman and logos of some ancient rune or something, right? Yeah, this part is actually about Vidyabum. There's definitely a bunch of old bottles in here. Does alcohol go bad? It only improves. It's all good, Alex. Russell, you're breaking up. The vodka has gone to Alex. The vodka is gone. All right, here's a bottle that demonstrates the liquid physics a lot better. And there was a commentary note in my last stream. Um, where they described exactly how this works, and it was just so ridiculously complicated that I just couldn't even couldn't even understand it. So apparently, there is no actual volume in here. The bottles are empty, and it's just completely an illusionary trick. So there is no actual liquid physics or anything going on here. It just keeps track of like the rotation. While well, spoilers, Jeff walking. It says in the subtitles. Um, so that's why this can be done so cheaply. Like, this is being calculated on tons of versions of this everywhere, but it's just shaders, man. Shaders can do some crazy stuff. Not in El El Elb. Uh, is it? Provakvasna vodka, forty percent. Look at all that combine language. All right. Yeah, it's just a shader. Different viscosities too, probably. Yeah, this is the Raven home of HLA. All right, let's get some commentary. But I need a good thumbnail for this too. Let me let me make a here. We'll just hold on this for a bit for commentary. I mean, I do know exactly how to get through this part, but I won't speed run it because I want to take it all in. I'll pretend like I don't know what's going on. All right. Some of our earliest experiments on the project involved placing old Half-Life 2 models in a level and walking around them in VR. These included static models of enemies, like combine soldiers or zombies. We found that players really enjoyed being able to inspect these models because VR let them get much closer than they'd been able to in the past. Players reported getting a sense of the true size of the characters Yes. and would often point out details that they had never noticed before, even though they had seen these models many times throughout Half-Life 2. These reactions led us to the idea of creating an enemy that took advantage of that experience, one that required players to spend long periods of time in close physical proximity to it. Mm -hmm. But enemies typically don't let the player get near them without attacking, so we felt it made fictional sense for this enemy to be blind, and to feature non-combat gameplay as its focus. Early experiments with guiding a blind creature using sounds were immediately interesting and gave us a way to create scenarios unique to the product. 
Thus, the concept for Jeff, known as the Bind Zombie internally, was born. Very nice. Cockroaches. Cockroaches make a return. Wait, screenshot? Look at this tutorialization. I see right through your tricks, developer. You're reminding me that these things make noise. Game developers think they're so smart. Forcing me to interact with this thing that's gonna be useful later. Beautiful. I like the big pile up of signs right there. My fallen Helix, Team Helix comrades. What a fate. You didn't deserve this. These are regular people. These are not combine. They're on the side of the combine, but they're not like genetically altered. They're just people who were forced to work. Yeah, he's been slimed. He's playing, uh, what would you do? With Mark Summers. What 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 could you do? Can't breathe when you're around the BTs. The Zen flora you see on the wall here which we refer to as zen ears for Simon obvious Fox. reasons. Animal in reaction to the same sounds as Jeff. Early in development, we would observe situations where playtesters would fail to notice Jeff becoming enraged by a sound. If the player died as a result, they felt frustrated and wronged. We worked to make Jeff's animations and sounds communicate his level of aggression to the player as clearly as possible. But if players weren't looking at Jeff, they could still be caught unaware. Adding these zen ear growths to the environment was a way for us to help players be more aware of Jeff's reactions to sound. The zen ears work as an extra layer of visual feedback for Jeff's behavioral state. One that lives in the environment instead of on Jeff himself. I actually did not realize these are supposed to be ears. That's amazing. Huh. <laughs> Yeah, don't mess with Simon. Simon Fox. Oh, I love this area. This is where we get to see all of the hazmat equipment. Well, a lot of it anyway. Got all these, like, things. Tablets. Hey, what exactly are these? These like rat away anti nerve agent, anti nerve agent, antibacterial, anti radiation agent, antibacterial, anti. Anti-emetic? What does that mean? Anti-emetic. Do we have any medical experts in chat that know what anti-emetic is? Oh, and all these tools. I've been meaning to add these tools to my uh, VR chat avatar. Because I want to be able to do, to do like... Uh, organ extractions. 
So I haven't seen anyone do anything like that before. I'll take a screenshot to remind me of these tools. Tools. Oh yeah, and these um, Geiger counters, which are real. You can buy this exact model. And it has a big thing that connects to it that you plug in and then you hold the hose and then you touch that to things to test it. And they only cost like 60 bucks or something. They're relatively cheap considering what they are. Okay. Interesting. Alex, come in, Alex. Alex? What? Oh, there you are. There you are. There's no straight shot to the vault. I'm going to head inside and find a way out. Anti nausea. Oh. Come on, game. I know they were trying to prevent people from having to, like, violently swing around their room, but I really, in, in VR, I want to take a chair, just smash it over a table. Just smash it, and then throw the remains. I know there is, like, a bar fight game that's out there that looked fun to try. From the beginning of development, we intended to feature a variety of visually distinct zen flora and fauna in Half-Life Alex, but we didn't yet know how these visual elements would be used to craft interesting gameplay. Referred to internally as zen clams, the zen plants you would see here were originally built to add visual flavor to the world and were only lightly interactive. They would track the player's head and hands and would close tight if the player got too close. When we began working on Jeff, we wanted to find surprising new ways to use sound as a core gameplay mechanic. In particular, we wanted to make players wary of the environment around them. We realized we could use the Zen Clams as a type of noise hazard by having them repeatedly snap open and shut when approached by the player. We had already placed these clams in earlier parts of the game, which meant that players would reach the distillery with an understanding of how they functioned. The introduction of Jeff changed the player's relationship with the Zen Clams, as they went from being harmless but annoying to a dangerous hazard that players would need to take care to avoid. Oh. And yeah, it is okay to talk about spoiler stuff in chat. I've played through the game like three times, and the commentary already spoils stuff. I think it's fine. So just, yeah, be aware, people watching, that uh, we might talk about stuff that happens way later in the game. Ripped in half by a strider. <laughs> Talking about ways that you would have preferred to die. Ooh. God, I love the way these look.
Hey, you with the uh, with the blood on you. You with the blood. I uh, got a little situation here. Yeah, you sure do. You uh, you don't happen to have a gun on you, do you? No. Oh. Man. You know, I thought we had an agreement. You keep your tongue to yourself, and I don't shoot you in it. Sorry, I couldn't keep my tongue to myself. Yeah, look at that. It's a, it's a nice one, too. Thanks. What the hell was that? Oh, that's Jeff. Jeff? Oh, don't worry. You can't see. Ears, just fine, no? Got an ear like Mozart. Who? All right, now let me help you out. All right, see you on the other side, Greenhorn. And keep your voice down. Uh, allows Alex from the game. Change the to Alex from there. And I believe you're doing displays both Alex's from the timeline. The oversight or is that intended? That, that's a whole part of the game's story that I don't... I still don't fully understand. It's like when you talk about timelines and like which one is the real timeline, which one is... Like, is there a such thing as a real timeline? We just have to, to be comfortable with the fact that there could be multiple... I don't know. I really don't like it when games mess with time. I mean, it was cool seeing what they did in this game, but I was like, oh, great. Now it's going to become significantly harder to keep track of what's what in the storyline. Early versions of the distillery explored a variety of methods for subtlety teaching players how Jeff works without any explicit exposition. Though some of the training techniques were quite successful, anything less than a complete understanding of Jeff's behavior resulted in players bungling their way through this section of the game and having a terrible time doing it. Eventually, we determined that explicit training was necessary, and that's where the character of Larry came in. Larry acts as a gate, delivering critical information about Jeff's behavior before allowing the player to proceed. It's a dense learning environment and a delicate balancing act, ensuring that we deliver the rules of Jeff while still making Larry an interesting character. To spread out the exposition, you'll notice that it's distributed over a few different story beats as Larry first introduces Jeff, then demonstrates Jeff's predictable reaction to a breaking bottle, and finally explains that the player can prevent their own coughing on Zen spores by covering their mouth. I feel like the cough or the mouth covering thing should have only been possible to do at this point because it was so weird to me when I was playing the game for the first time and I was, I was trying to just like scratch my face or pretend like I'm eating something like why why is it what is this it was really weird There is some achievement for not letting any bottles break during the entirety of the sequence or something like that. Which I'm not going to attempt that. Because that would be really tedious. Oh, well, you have to let them break. Them. Well, no, what was it? I mean, you have to break bottles to actually complete this part. So maybe it wasn't that. It must have been something else. Also, there's a little bit of foreshadowing in this room over here. I'll just climb up on the table, no problem. Uh, this. Hmm. Cut. Yeah, I'm reading what everybody says. Just don't always have something to contribute.
All right, I need to be immersed in this part because I think this part's really cool. Hey, hey, those things are nasty. You gotta cover your mouth. Got it, thanks. Hey, I, I almost forgot, what's your name? Alex, Alex Vance. Hey Alex, I'm Larry, nice to meet you. Try not to get killed. Look at that. They put one of the ears right in front of you so you can see. Breaking bottle. Jeff makes a noise. Ears scrunch up. A big piece of equipment. Maybe I can use this later. I'll just take it with me. Like a kind of monitor. Yeah, this is the section that's hard for some people to play in VR. A core element of both the environment and Jeff himself are the Zen plants seen here spewing toxic gas that makes the player cough. These were not created to be merely ornamental or to support the novel VR interaction of players covering their mouth. They were added specifically to solve a long-standing challenge that we had with illustrating Jeff's personal space. One of the trickier aspects of designing Jeff was striking the right balance between perceived threat and actual threat. Many scenarios in the level forced the player into close proximity with Jeff in order to create tension. We found that these moments could be exciting, but they could also become frustrating when players accidentally got too close to Jeff and were killed unexpectedly. Players reported not understanding how close is too close. We tried a number of solutions, such as adding glowing tentacles to Jeff that acted as a visual representation mm. of the perimeter of his personal space. Touch the tentacles, and you die. Getting the look and feel of these tentacles to a satisfactory place proved challenging, however, and we backed away from the idea. Another problem we encountered was that a subset of our players quickly became comfortable around Jeff once they became adept at keeping their distance from him and avoiding sources of noise. For these players, dealing with Jeff felt trivial. He simply didn't feel like a threat to them. We discussed a variety of potential solutions to these problems, even wacky concepts, such as giving Jeff the ability to teleport to sources of noise. But it was difficult to come up with ideas that didn't feel like we were giving Jeff the ability to cheat. Eventually, we came up with the idea of having the player cough. This was appealing, as it gave us a way to make the player themselves a source of noise, thus causing Jeff to pursue them. We were also interested in making the environment more dangerous generally, and so our first experiments with coughing involved littering the level with zen plants spewing toxic gas. Initial tests showed a lot of promise. Players now felt like Jeff was a dangerous pursuer and they must carefully observe the environment to avoid the gas. We observed that yes. players had a natural instinct to cover their mouth with their hand to suppress their cough. This was an affordance that VR with tracked hand controllers supported very naturally, so we implemented this mechanic right away. This still left us with the problem of players being unsure of how close they could safely get to Jeff. We realized that the early experiment of adding tentacles to Jeff could be replaced with a much simpler approach of attaching a toxic cloud directly to him. There were multiple benefits to this. First, it gave players visual feedback for how far they needed to stay away from Jeff to be safe. Second, it made those times when Jeff did get close all the more tense, with players now needing to commit a hand to covering their mouth. Finally, we didn't need to teach the players anything new. They could carry forward what they had already learned about toxic gas in the environment and apply those lessons to Jeff himself. Some say that concept of coughing became so popular around Valve that they single-handedly influenced the, 
Pokemon card makers to spread coughing as far and wide as they could, making it one of the most common cards to get during unpacking, during pack openings or whatever. I'm gonna check controller power. Okay, it's good. Another tutorial. Wow, there's a lot of commentary in this area. One of our major goals in the design of Half-Life Alex was to reach the widest possible audience. This meant developing for all of the major VR hardware in the market, as well as accommodating different sized play spaces, traversal preferences, and so on. The accessibility option that had the most knock-on effects into the design of the game from controller bindings, to game logic, to level design, was the support of a single controller mode for players who don't use two controllers. In this mode, reloading is performed by moving the weapon to the shoulder and pressing a button, much oh, like arcade games that. which require the player to fire their weapon off screen to reload. The flashlight was modified to attach to the primary hand, and gas masks were added so that players could muffle their coughs hands free. Oh. Even the gun used in the final Strider battle, with its two-handed aiming and reloading controls, was modified to be operable with one hand. Interesting. So the gas masks were actually an accessibility thing originally, huh? Also, yeah, watch, watching this part of the game, this isn't your best first exposure to this. There's going to be a lot of stopping and listening to the commentary that will kind of break up the suspense. But there's a lot of streams out there that kind of show what this is like for people doing it the first time. Uh, One of our major goals oh. in the design of how. Alright. As we refined Jeff's behavior and visual design, we thought a lot about how we wanted players to feel about him. The goal was to have playtesters describe Jeff with words such as menacing, threatening, <laughs> and deadly. And for that reason, it became important that players not survive if they got too close to Jeff. So we decided that his attack should result in instant death. This would teach players unambiguously that Jeff was too dangerous to trifle with. But it left us with the challenge of teaching this to players without necessarily killing them. The approach we took was to give the player opportunities to witness Jeff attack and kill other characters. Early versions of the level included scenarios where Jeff and the player would encounter zombies and combine soldiers. Mm. The player could attack these enemies, or use sound to lure Jeff into place so that he could pummel them with his massive arms. God, that would have sucked. This gave players an opportunity to witness Jeff's power and his method of attack without dying at his hands themselves. Unfortunately, this outcome wasn't guaranteed as some players would opt to kill those enemies themselves. And having these other characters present was also quite expensive in terms of animation, sound, and level content. We were already grappling with the challenge of keeping this level well paced and within scope, and so we cut these sections. But this still left us with the original problem of how to demonstrate Jeff's ability to kill without killing the player. We chose to address this by adding beats to existing animated sequences. For example, when the player opens this two-handed roller door, we added a head crab for Jeff to munch on in full view of the player. Spoilers. We also added a similar beat to the later elevator ride, with Jeff smashing a head crab against a wall before Spoilers. melting it down with acid. You know, I feel I I, I want to know how a lot of the team that worked on this game felt about being absorbed into Valve. Like a lot Uh-oh. Um, a lot of you might not know, but the team that worked on um, uh, on Firewatch 
and was a t they were working on another game that was announced at like an E3 or something like that. They were absorbed or whatever by Valve, and then they immediately had to abandon the game they were working on to work on Half-Life Alex. But the games that they were working on were like really narrative heavy, non-violent. Like they are very proud of the fact that their games had no shooting and it was about kind of like uh like emotional intelligence and relationships and kind of like delicate subject matter and all that and then they come to valve and they're doing like really violent shooting oriented dystopian worlds with a lot of video game cliches and things like that i would just i kind of want to know how that team felt being brought on the valve to create games that were so different than what they were really proud to be making previously. And I know there is like a documentary that I still need to watch that Jeff Keighley was involved with. Um, but I, I gotta check that out. It's on Steam. Called like The Final Hours or something like that. Alright. Just a little more commentary. Even though Larry instructs the player on the basics of how Jeff works, we found that we needed to let players test those rules without having Jeff in their immediate personal space. If we made players first interact with Jeff face to face, they often fell to pieces and forgot the rules. They would die over and over again, and their fear of Jeff would quickly turn into frustration and annoyance. This area was created to serve as a training playground where players can observe Jeff reacting to various sounds while remaining safe from his attacks. Very smart. It contains many of the elements that are encountered throughout the rest of the level. Forces you to shoot. Including some falling bottles, a padlock that needs to be shot, and various types of Zen plants. Jeff remains close enough to feel threatening, but he cannot attack the player. Players can spend as much time here as they need to, and move on when they feel like they've got a good grip on how Jeff works. Very clever. All right. I'm ready. You ready? It's like an interactive PDF, right? <laughs> Keep going. Oh, 
on, damn it. Jeff, why you gotta be so big? Uh. Oh, I know what I'm supposed to do. Okay, I'm dumb. Even though Larry instructs the player on the basics of how Jeff works, we found that we needed to let players test those rules without having Jeff in their Shut up. Oh fuck. Even though I've played this, it's still really suspenseful. <laughs> Wonder what this area smells like. There is actually a part in the game where Alex specifically says like, Oh, I won't get over the smell. And then it's like, Alex, what does it smell like? He's like, smells like... Like, what did she say? Like garbage and ammonia or something like that. Jeff's character design went through several significant revisions over the course of development. Just by looking at him we wanted players to understand certain things about the character. Our first priority was to communicate his blindness. Second, we wanted the character to feel physically imposing. After all, the entire concept of Jeff had grown out of our observation that just being close to a character in VR could make for a powerful experience. Finally, we wanted players to understand the blind zombie's behavioural state at a glance. Is he feeling angry? Did he just hear something and is feeling curious? And so on. The first design that we modelled and animated was a sort of combine worker robot. The robot's face featured a holographic display that could flip between different icons that represented its state. Hmm. A large piece of rebar jutted out of the back of the robot's head, sparking electricity and spewing smoke. This was meant to demonstrate that its visual sensors were impaired, making it blind. Interesting. We made the robot tall and hulking. It looked heavy, unpredictable and dangerous. I want to see those designs. However, player reactions to this robotic design showed that it had problems. Players would initially focus on the head's holographic display. Passing the face and understanding the meaning of the icons proved too challenging for players. And even worse, this element distracted from the rebar poking through the robot's head and their understanding that it was blind. Players found the robot imposing, but we weren't getting the deeply visceral reaction of fear that was desired. A trip back to the drawing board landed us with the more organic character you see in front of you. Drawing inspiration from the idea of coal miners succumbing to the black lung, we focused on the concept of a member of the Combine's Zen cleanup crew that had succumbed to the Zen infection. Oh. This gave us the visceral reaction from players which we were looking for. A human face is still visible, but the eyes are clearly decayed, communicating blindness. The organic nature of this design allowed us to lean more heavily on audio to feed back the behavioural state with animalistic grunts and roars that came to include more human-sounding elements over time. Awesome. Oh, you can see it in the final hours of have I really gotta watch that documentary now. Wonder if it would be shitty of me to buy the documentary, because it's like... 10 bucks or something and just show the whole thing on stream. I mean, I wouldn't put the stream on YouTube and the VOD would eventually delete itself from Twitch. But, like, I really want to watch all that and I think a lot of you would like to watch it too. I mean, Jeff Keighley is like a billionaire, so I don't think he'll mind. I could wait till it's on sale, but honestly, like, I want to support any 
Half-Life related media because the series is just so important to me. Alright, back to this. Good thing this doesn't detect your microphone if I had to actually be silent. Jeff's character design went through Shut several up. You're gonna get him over here. Shh. over the course Oops. of development. Oh fuck! <laughs> Just by looking at him, we wanted players to understand certain things about the character. Commentary Our man. First priority was to communicate his blindness. Commentary, but dude, shut up! All right. God, this whole area is a death sentence. They're like tempting you with all these items. And it's just stuff is just covered in bottles. I'm going to demonstrate how I thought you had to solve this puzzle at first. Still pretty terrified. God, it's animated so well. And I like how he isn't 100% predictable. Like, he still makes some sudden movements you wouldn't expect. Like, now he's going over here. When previously he was just walking back and forth over there. Yeah, this is a distillery that we're in right now. Alright, here we go. Let's go, let's go. Faster, 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 faster. Go, go, go. Go, 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 go! Oh, 
<laughs> you bastards. mean Val's being to the player here. Alright, a mild break here. Counter puzzles are a useful design tool, since they force players to move around the environment and also occupy their primary hand via use of the multi-tool. In this area, the player has to aim their flashlight to navigate, point their offhand to teleport, cover their mouth to prevent coughing, follow wires with the multi-tool, and potentially pull bottles with their gravity gloves. The player has to make trade-offs as they proceed, since their two hands are overcommitted by design. One-handed players are even more overwhelmed by these many tasks. This is why we littered the distillery with gas masks the player can attach to their mouth so they won't have to use a hand to muffle their cough. This toner puzzle went through several revisions, many of which left Jeff free to roam while players worked on the puzzle. Oh my god. But this resulted in players having to juggle too many elements at once, <laughs> and their fear of Jeff quickly turned into frustration. Good. The solution was to I'm keep Jeff good locked that they up while players solved didn't the puzzle, with, that. with his distant roars maintaining a level of tension. We were then left with the problem of how to release Jeff so the level could continue. Initial ideas involved having Jeff break out from the freezer on his own when the puzzle was complete, but this felt contrived and scripted compared to having the player free Jeff from the freezer. The toner puzzle mechanic gave us a logical solution to this problem, with the added benefit of creating a moment of high tension for the player when they realize they're going to have to open the freezer door and release Jeff in order to proceed. Spoilers, but... Toner puzzles are a useful design tool. I like throwing the commentary into the world. All right. Yeah, I remember this moment. And I was like, all right. All right, just following the line. And it goes inside the freezer. God, this whole area in the dark in VR is so cool looking.
rescuing the commentary it has become part of the gameplay. Many of our ideas for Jeff involved coming up with plausible ways to force Jeff and the player to occupy an enclosed space at the same time. An elevator ride was on the table from the beginning, but we were unsure of how successful it would be in execution. There was also a concern that such a sequence could be technically expensive to pull off. Our first prototype was extremely rudimentary. Players would get into an elevator with Jeff, the ride would last around 30 seconds, and then Jeff and the player would exit. There was no complicated level scripting, no bespoke animations for Jeff, and no special audio or lighting treatment. Despite the relative lack of polish, players had a strong positive reaction to the sequence, even naming it a highlight of the game when we ran company-wide playtests. <laughs> This convinced us that it was worth putting more work into the elevator ride to make it something really special. In the end, a lot of different disciplines came together to create the final sequence, which combines sound, animation, scripted lighting, and careful choreography of Jeff's movements and the player's actions. Damn. Very strategically placed glow-in-the-dark energy wire. Letting me know that I have to uh, go in here. All right, Jeff, are you are you? Fuck. He is indeed. Where do I hide? Ideas for Jeff. No, I haven't done the gnome run ever. Seems too tedious for me, but... Rest in peace. It's still warm. Hmm. Hmm. 
guiding me with light. Just, uh, just, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. physics, physics, cooperate, please. Physics, okay, okay. Whoa. Commentary on the run. The, time, the noises that attract Jeff are created by the player, oh, who is either fuck, actively fuck. trying to lure him to a new location, or has perhaps made a noisy mistake that could have been avoided. Shut up! The Shut key up. point being that the player Ooh. feels some amount of responsibility for the noises being made. The goal of the upcoming hallway was to flip that idea on its head, if only for a moment. Like a misbehaving pet, this cheeky head crab appears to surprise and infuriate the player, cheeky. clumsily knocking over a series of bottles before escaping into a vent. Classic oh, head crab oh. nonsense. We were surprised to find that many players wanted to check and see if the head crab had indeed escaped. They would climb up onto the boxes and crane their head up into the vents. This prompted the idea of adding a small easter egg to reward those players. Try it and you'll find that the cheeky crab has indeed escaped to be annoying another day. <laughs> the cost of adding these sorts of secrets needs to be weighed against the potential for players to actually discover them. In this case, our playtest observations made the cost appear worth it, in particular for the impact it would have in making the world feel more real. A full reality where living creatures go about their lives, even if the player isn't there to witness them. I like that. Say I can look up into the vent. Oh, unless they just meant that the head crab went up and in. I don't think I can actually look inside the vent. Walk on. Mm. Balancing on a fence post. What is that pop in? I'm gonna refund this game now. God, I hate the look of these things. <laughs> Most of the time, the noises that attract Jeff are created by the player, who is either actively hey. trying to lure him to a new location... Hey. this one. Clam chatter? Is clam zen clam chatter? Is that just someone from Boston saying zen clam chowder? Chatter? Is 
blow up. Ugh. Minus two, ugh. Right on you, or good on you, I don't know. Congratulating me on making it this far. Oh. Hmm. Alex, coming in. Hey, Alex. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? More or less. We're breaking up. I think you're still in the distillery. I need a friend named Jeff. Well, that's great. Take all the help we can get. <laughs> yeah, we're not really close. Listen, there should be a big we tunnel sized plug though. in the floor there somewhere. That's gonna be the tunnel out of here? Correct. You get it open, I'll figure out where it leads. I don't know, we got pretty close. Jeff definitely uh, spread his seed and it got inside me, my lungs. Uh, we got three batteries. Ain't over yet. Hello? Can you open the door, please? I wish you could knock. This part of my first run of the game took me a long time to get through. Like. I was going about a puzzle the complete wrong way, and I th it felt like it was the right way to go, so I kept trying over and over again until someone in chat finally came in and said, like, no, you just gotta do this, it's way easier than you're making it, and then it, it was way easier. Combine force fields. Since the entire premise of Jeff hinged on keeping Jeff and the player in close proximity to each other, the distillery map was constructed as a series of chambers connected by one-way transitions. Early on, we used two techniques in concert to keep Jeff and the player together throughout the level. First, each new area was gated with a special locked door. These took the form of impenetrable Zen membranes that only Jeff could tear through. Uh, the player would lure Jeff to the membrane using sound, insane. and Jeff would break it open so that both Jeff and the player could proceed. In the we had always had a goal of having players describe Jeff in adversarial terms, as a constant pursuer or a thorn in their side. The problem with the Zen Membrane concept was that it led to players describing Jeff as a useful tool, or worse, an angry co-op partner, huh. rather than something they feared. Another way that we would keep Jeff and the player together was via the use of one-way drops. That edit, though. Jeff would fall off catwalks, platforms, and ladders into each new area. These drops functioned as intended, but just like the Zen Membranes, elicited an undesirable reaction from players, especially when repeated multiple times. Watching Jeff do these pratfalls left the players feeling like he was less dangerous. They felt sorry for him, and even laughed at him. Eventually, mm. we realized that we could use combined force fields, which the player cannot pass through, as a way to create one-way doors. These force fields allowed Jeff to move through them, but required the player to follow via another one-way path. This allowed us to build thresholds where Jeff and the player could both move forward while eliminating the awkwardness of the Zen membranes and avoiding the repeated falls that had previously made Jeff look so clumsy. Combine force fields also had a few other benefits. For one, they gave Jeff a convenient way to take a backstage route that is inaccessible to the player, like the one at the bottom of this ladder. They also tied in nicely with Jeff's fictional background as a former member of the Combine Zen cleanup crew. I like it. All right. Jeff Stiffer. Since the entire premise of Jeff.
Okay. I hate you, Jeff. Wow, rude. Nicely done. I like how you go between the sort of meditative music from out there and right back into here. By the time Alex is done with this part, he's just gonna be just like. <sighs> Dropping a cigarette was enough to make him come over here. Yeah, I'm hanging on to this one for, for, uh, Murray, I mean, uh, Russell. For our band meeting. Creating an experience with such a heavy focus on audio presented some unique design problems. The primary challenge was determining which sounds Jeff should be able to hear and making sure that players understood the rules. Half-Life Alex contains a vast array of physics objects. However, through playtesting we found it best to use only a small set of them in the distillery. We needed to pay close attention to each object that we did include, particularly to audio design for collisions between the object and the various surface types used in the distillery. It was important that what players heard matched their expectations for how Jeff would react. In early testing, we would find individual cases where players would say things like, I don't know why Jeff got angry, or I would have expected that noise to attract Jeff. Over time, we identified like these relationship cases problems. and addressed them one by one. It was vital that players always be able to identify the cause and effect of a noise that might attract Jeff. Failing this meant players were left feeling like Jeff acted randomly and they'd grow frustrated. Some experiments failed in this area. At one point, parts of the level were littered with piles of broken glass that would make noise if the player walked or teleported over them. Few players would notice the broken glass and were then surprised when Jeff attacked, so this concept was cut to avoid confusion. We had to be wary of the opposite case too, where players would expect purely aesthetic elements to present a noise hazard. For example, at one point we had placed shallow pools of water seeping in among the floor tiles. It looked really cool, but it confused some of our playtesters, who thought that the sound of their footsteps splashing through these puddles would be audible to Jeff, even though we never intended that to be the case. Huh. Oh, those players. Okay, there's a lot of temptation happening over here, but I try to focus on this. All right, so... Yeah, I need to take the USB out of my controllers because I've been trying to throw things while crouched down on the floor tethered by USB cables and I'm like literally ripping these cables out of the wall. In fact, they weren't even plugged in this whole time because I pulled them out of the wall. Okay, let me <laughs> hook them back in. Oh God. Wow. Thought they were charging this whole time, and they weren't. Sacrificed my ability to throw for electricity. All right. As soon as this part ends, I gotta plug them back in. 
just randomly pull a mag out of my backpack by accident. Okay, because I need this whole section has a lot of panic moments. So this is the part that I got stuck on for a long time. How was that enough noise to make him come over here? Hey there. Are you kidding me? Okay, that would have killed me. All right, let's go, 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 go. Go, 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 go. Oh, fuck. Okay. When you think about it, it's nice to see the subtitles. That's it. Uh, subtitles going faster than the audio, just like all the other dev commentaries. It's nostalgic that way. I know, like, a lot of people don't put time into the timing of their subtitles and movies and stuff like that. Like, I always, it's kind of annoying for me a lot of times to have subtitles on in movies, is because, like, they spoil things that are about to happen. Because, like, they come on too soon, or someone walks on screen and then you see a giant paragraph of subtitles up here, it's like, okay, now I know this person is just going to give a big speech, and it kind of takes away from it. Like, I'd rather they were split up into very small groups that go with the pacing of the person speaking, not just, here's the giant wall of text they're about to say. Ugh. Is this the latest dating app? Inge? How is this going to help me meet people? Ugh. I don't get it. Yeah, I posted hinge. God, I hate that teleport. And there's a lot of temptations for ammunition and stuff over there. Don't really want to mess with, which I should actually save. 
All right, yeah, he's the most complicated one to get. That was satisfying. <laughs> here. Love how the ammo and stuff glows. So cool looking. have used it to revive this dude. Oh, game, you're so mean. All right. Shoot. Mm. Okay, so I'm good. I'll throw with my left hand. I can grab with my right hand. coughed. Alright, we're done with that. And there we go. In an off world relocation. 
inoculate assemble what is this hmm looks familiar oh Use this as a weapon. Like, shh, shh. Now that all of that is taken care of, Oh, he was probably the best bottle to demonstrate liquid. Liquid. Figuring out how to end the player's journey through the distillery involved a lot of discussion about how players would ultimately end up feeling about Jeff. Observing playtests told us that most players simply wanted him dead, usually from the moment they met him, but there were some who felt kind of sorry for him and didn't necessarily want to see him killed. Our first version of the ending involved the player's actions unintentionally resulting in Jeff being attacked and dragged away by antlions. Part of the goal was to demonstrate that the antlions are even more powerful than Jeff to amp up the tension just before players have to square off against antlions themselves. Spoiler. This ending left players feeling a little empty. They felt detached from Jeff's demise and wanted to be more directly involved. Dark stuff, to be sure. Plus, we weren't really servicing those players who felt sorry for Jeff and didn't necessarily want to see him killed. There were other problems too. The antlion attack felt random to many players, which reduced its impact. And because Jeff presumably died off screen, players were left without a sense of closure. This prevented players from being able to switch gears and settle in for their encounter with the antlions. The trash compactor was a solution to these problems. It gave players the opportunity to decide Jeff's fate and be left with a sense of closure whether they decided to squash him or just leave him imprisoned. Even so, it has to be admitted that most players seem to crush Jeff with zero hesitation. Monsters. Exactly. <laughs> All right, well, I am a sympathetic person, 
and I also uh, highly value scientific discovery. So I'm gonna leave you to live so that others may come across Jeff and understand Jeff's plight and serve as a warning to future people that come in, in contact with the infestation about what can happen. I'm gonna use Jeff as an example. And plus, I don't know, maybe Larry was friends with Jeff. I know it could be seen as a situation of, um, of mercy, but unlike the zombies, Jeff here isn't saying, oh God, kill me or anything like that. He seems to be so gone that he's just beyond recovery at this point. Sorry, I'm gonna sneeze. Okay. I feel like it could potentially be awful being a zen mutilated human if there was some semblance of a person still trapped in a body. That seems like it would be mercy. I knew someone would say that. Larry can feed him later. You could say that about the head crab zombies, but I don't think uh, the person Jeff used to be is still alive. Yeah, I don't think so either. The zombies in Half-Life 2 make human-like noises, possibility that the human is conscious inside. Yeah, I mean, in Half-Life 2, they were, like, reversed voices, but on um, the zombies in here, they in Alex here, they still sound like people. And you can hear just by, like, the cadence that they speak, you can kind of understand what they say. <laughs> well, here's one of the masks that I could have worn to not worry about covering my mouth, but I thought it was more fun to have to just do the co mouth covering thing. All right, here we go. Oh, what did you do to Jeff? Yeah, I trapped Jeff in the trash compactor. Well, I uh, hope you came across some of the good stuff. Uh, I'll see you around. Okay, the coast is clear. Time to get that plug open so we can get through those tunnels. I love operating the machinery here. Wait. Oh, that's right. What? Let's do it fast enough. Stabby legs? Oh yes, uh, and very small, like ants. No. I uh, like tiny little lions. No, that's not them. These ones are pretty dangerous. Right. Uh, well, whatever they are, they're down that tunnel. Yep. Off I go. All right. See you later. Thanks for the raid on the stream a little bit ago. I can just tell there's a smell emanating from here. Okay.
We just have to hear Jeff banging on the door the entire rest of the game. How's it going? I guess Jeff's taking tomorrow off. Well, one thing that Russell brings up is that he originally applied to work at Black Mesa and he was rejected his job offer. So it's kind of like maybe there is a world in which he was employed at Black Mesa meaning that he probably would have died in the incident and wouldn't have been around to help Alex later on. So it's like, what kind of butterfly effect did him not getting the job at Black Mesa cause? very disappointed that the that the empty toilet paper roll does not make the proper sound when you drop it on the ground. It's supposed to go like doo -doo -doo, and make a noise. I'm really curious what the commentary is going to be like around this part because I feel like this is an area that probably had a lot of revision going on. Oh yeah, here. So that looks really nice with the um, refraction. Huh. You know, I hope you appreciate how much of a pain in the butt it is carrying this vodka around. Oh, you have gone above and beyond with what you've got there. It's reckless, excessive, and deeply appreciated. Oh, I'm taking one of these for myself. Huh. the explanation for Russell not existing in Half-Life 2. Well, one thing is that Russell was originally going to be Laszlo, who is someone that we see die. Well, we don't see. Actually, we do. We see Laszlo die in Half-Life 2. Remember, he's... Okay, shut up. Shut up. He's like, he's the, f the finest mind of his generation. You do know what antlions are. Yes, they're leggies. You weird New Zealanders. Uh, Russell character mo model evolved from the sailor character from episode three. Uh, I think his appearance was, but I don't think he was ever supposed to be the the fisherman. 
talking about the Lost Coast. Oh yeah, I can teleport. That is a hard word to pronounce, oh my god. Oh, I keep forgetting I can't jump. I keep trying to push the button that I used to jump in VR chat. Check what time it is. Okay, it's 5.45 here. Zoo Park. Or Zaya Park. I would sit and look at all the signs. But I want to... Speed this up a bit. In some of our early experiments bringing Half-Life 2 enemies to VR, we found that antlions in particular showed promise and were interesting to fight, but tended to quickly overwhelm playtesters. They were able to get into the player's physical space too quickly, and applied so much pressure that players just ended up endlessly teleporting around trying to get away. <laughs> around the same time, we were discovering that all players, even relative novices, have surprisingly good aim in VR. The variability of aiming ability amongst players is simply much lower in VR than it is in mouse and keyboard games. To take advantage of the idea that players would consistently be able to make precise shots, we started testing an antlion design which players could slow down by shooting off the legs. Playtesters reacted positively to both the need for accuracy and the organic feeling that this gave the antlions when their legs flew off and the injured antlion continued to limp toward them. The removal of the legs was clear to players. But presenting the fact that the abdomen was invulnerable until the legs were removed was a long-standing challenge. There was no single solution to communicating this effectively to playtesters, but rather a series of small additions that communicated the behavior. For example, we made the abdomen dull and black when invulnerable, and changed it to match the bright orange legs as it became vulnerable. Shooting armored parts of the antline would generate sparks and hard ricochet sounds, while shooting the vulnerable body parts resulted in orange blood spurts and soft impact sounds. We also designed the death animations to emphasize the abdomen exploding and ensured that an exploded abdomen chunk was left behind after the antlion was dead. All right. Uh, I will say that when I played Half-Life 2 in VR, that Gary's Mod mod, the antlions were insufferably obnoxious to deal with, so I know exactly what they're talking about. They were not fun, because they were always right up in your face, constantly. Especially when you're trying to drive around and all that, it was so irritating. I think it got so annoying to the point that I just turned on god mode just to get through the part. It was quite an abrupt change of ambient sound. All right.
standing up for this one. Squish, squish. And microphone is tangled. Oh, there we go. All right, I'm gonna waste so much pistol ammo. Let me just do this. And this is hard mode too, so everything takes more hits. I love the way that the antlion hive nest or whatever looks. So cool. Actually don't even need this. Today's a good day for you, grub. Gotta do this. That, that was dynamic. Hey, any news on the data pod? Ah, uh, your dad's head's down. He's working on it. He's got to be close. Great. So I plan on finishing this tonight. Maybe... I won't be getting to playing the mods tonight. Um, I'll just do just Half-Life Alex mods the next time I stream. Feels very relieving to be away from Jeff, it really does. Proof that you're seeing out of my right eye. That probably looks slightly off center to you guys. Kind of be like uh, the movie The Mask, except when you put this on, you just become furry. In some of our early. Oh, I can't get it off. No. No. Okay. Whew. Became Hotline Miami. Yeah. Alex shouldn't become an alcoholic anyway. So, I'll leave this here. Replace it with grenade. Central... Central Zuya Park. Central Zoo Park? Is 
there's a lot of uh, offshoot places you can go in this part of the game that I'm going to skip. Just for the sake of speeding up this run. So I'm not going to go to all the like secret little spots. It's usually just to get more ammo or whatever, so... And this area looks fantastic. I'm really curious about the commentary for these areas. Thank you. Save you for later. Foliage. All of the foliage in the game animates in response to player touch and environmental wind conditions. The foliage animation is entirely procedural and is computed on the graphics processor using vertex shader deformation. Nice. A voxel field that travels with the player's body is used to track the location of the player's hands in space. The hands effectively draw motion trails into this voxel field, which can be sampled by the foliage's vertex shader and used to drive deformations allowing the player to bat the foliage around with their hands. The foliage also interacts with wind, allowing us to give ambient motion to the plants. In order to accommodate a range of environmental design, we tuned the wind deformations at different speeds, from slight drafts to hurricane force winds. It turned out, though, that the ambient wind was never required to be more than a moderate breeze. <laughs> For most of development, the hurricane effect was unused. This particular zoo habitat was added late in development and That's required a critical extension to the procedural foliage animation system. Prior to adding this habitat, the foliage didn't need to deform in response to enemy animation or grenade explosions, but of course, this area is all about throwing grenades at zombies. To address this, we added a low-resolution voxel field that could be sampled by the foliage shader to apply additional deformations. This low-resolution voxel field, which is about one cubic foot per voxel, is fixed in space and spans the entire habitat. For comparison, the voxel field that travels with the player is about two cubic inches per voxel. Enemies and grenades within the space can write motion trails and impacts into the low-resolution voxel field, which are ultimately interpreted by the foliage shader as wind forces. This is when preparation met opportunity. When grenades explode, they are creating localized hurricane force winds. Oh. Let me stroke my bro here. There. Okay, so now we can witness localized hurricane nice I saw that Disgusting? Hey, it's nothing disgusting. It's all natural. What is it? this whole wall is very interesting. I have a feeling because this looks like real children's art, not the kind of stuff that's like an adult clearly trying to emulate how children make art. Like this actually looks like something kids would draw. So these are probably done by like developers, kids. Wow, this kid's going places. Look at this. Disgusting. Narwhal's gross. Cool rainbow horn, though. What the hell is this? This is beautiful, though, over here. I like this. Okay, now this 
has very weird connotations here. Uh, you would think that this was all done before the Seven Hour War, because with the Resonance Cascade throwing the whole world into chaos, did this kid like really visit the zoo and hand over his like civil protection uh, dude? about to beat a giraffe and just like handed it over to the zoo that's probably already overrun by zombies and antlions and stuff like th it's like what does this mean for the timeline fun fact is that the horn of a narwhal is actually an elongated tooth extending through its face oh it's even more horrifying There should be no kids left in City 17 due to the whole we made a device that kept people from having kids. No, 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 no. So, there were already children that existed. Not like everyone became adults. Like, the whole... Um, the whole timeline of everything from Resident, Residence Cascade to Episode 2 only spans, like, 20 years at the most? And the suppression field didn't happen until late in the timeline of events after the Combine had invaded. And that was far into the invasion, too. So, like, one thing that they said that was interesting about, um... Uh, about... Half-Life 2 is people are always like, how come there's no children anywhere? And it was largely because... All the adults that you see in the game, all the young adults, are the final generation of humans, presumably, before, you know, the Combine get taken over or whatever. Or, Combine get taken down. Quick, quick! Quick, quick! Whoa! Headshot. Uh, and there's that part in the scene where, in Half-Life 2, when you go to the playground and you hear the children... Uh-oh. Children... Um... As, like, an echo, a distant memory, like, there used to be children in this world kind of thing, but they're no longer around. Because of the Combine Suppression for you. Alex is a part of that final generation. True! She's one of the youngest people in the world. That actually makes a lot of sense. Oh, I was hoping there would be a commentary note in front of this. Because I want some answers. Where's the thing I can throw? Wow, that's a heavy mask. <laughs> Wait a minute. The commentary thing can break glass? What are the implications of that? It's a tangible thing in this world? Russ, do you think a head crack could turn a gorilla into a zombie? Honestly, if there's a gorilla on the loose, I'm not sure a head crab's gonna make it much worse. A gorilla? I really wanted to know if at some point in development, if they were act if they were actually going to have animal zombies. Moving on its own. Anyway, I said I was going to go up here quickly. And actually, I have a question about British accents. Because I know there's probably a lot of Euro folks watching the stream right now. Is that, I know there's a particular regional dialect 
of British English where they would pronounce the word law, L-A-W, as lore. It's against the lore. So what I'm wondering is to someone who has that dialect, does the word L-O-R-E and the word L-A-W, do they sound exactly the same to someone that says that? Like, the lore says that this person is this and that their background is blah, 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 or it's against the law to do this. You're like, or part of the lore is to say this, but it's against the lore. Do those two words sound identical to people that speak like that? Like, do you just grow up hearing it and you can't tell the difference? I don't know, this is probably just a really American thing to say. You're Australian, I pronounce them pretty much the same. So... Like, does it... When you pronounce it pretty much the same, like, do you... Did you grow up being confused? Why those... That one word was spelled two different ways or something like that? So gross. Uh, yeah, just like read and read lead and lead stuff like that 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 actually is a really good example yeah at least american english l-e-a-d can be lead or lead well it's a little bit different because like l-o-r-e and l-a-w are said the same but like l-e-a-d is could be said as lead or lead r-e-a-d could be read or read i guess it is a similar situation but uh, not that you can remember, context helps a lot. Lore isn't really a word you come across much anyways. True. I mean, there's a lot more examples than just that. This is one that always stuck out to me because there's someone that does GTA 5 roleplay, which, I, by the way, is a really fun streams to watch, the, uh, uh, the GTA 5 roleplay people. But there's a New Zealander Kiwi woman who has a police officer character that she calls Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N, Forcer, Lauren Forcer. And in English, I'd be like, oh, that's kind of a stretch because like it's it's not like Lauren, Law Enforcer, Lore Enforcer. And I realize that she's has a New Zealand accent. So to her, Law sounds like Lore. So like the play on words works for Lore Enforcer. It's just like a weird dialect thing. Kiwo, yeah, exactly. That's the streamer. There's uh, probably a Tom Scott video you. on that. What is it? Yeah, what is it, Dad? It doesn't look like they actually built the weapon. It's like they, I don't know, discovered something. Or maybe they uncovered it. What do you mean? If I'm reading this right, they tracked it to an old apartment building in the QC, but instead of going in to get it, they grabbed the whole building and built a vault around it. Holy crap. They must have been terrified of this thing. I'm trying to figure out whether we ought to be. Very interesting. Oh, that reminds me, I need to plug my controllers back in now that I'm in a post-Jeff world timeline okay where oh i gotta feel around my room to figure out where i am who i am how i am uh where did the usb cables go how 
did they get over there? Okay. Aha! That was cool. Look, you can see how you can see me handling my USB cables right now. This is a weird thing you don't see very often, because usually people outside of VR watch people with headsets on do weird things, interact with things that don't exist, virtual things, and it looks strange. But now you guys are watching me handle things in real life, and now in VR it looks like I'm just being weird handling things that don't exist like a, a reverse version of that situation. Very strange. And I gotta remember to get the, find the Death Stranding Easter egg that's in here. Okay, I gotta sit closer to the cables, so I don't yank them off the wall. Marskaya Riba. Ooh, this is foreboding. I don't even need this resin anymore. I love how the lighting looks on this. I bet this is a callback to Half-Life 1. Three, uh, like, examination boxes or whatever, with one of them has a head crab in it, and then when you go up to it, ah! does that. <laughs> Something similar happened in Half-Life 1. There were very few existing antlion sounds to work with coming into Half-Life Alex. So unlike most of the familiar Half-Life creatures, which often had legacy sounds layered in, nearly all of the sounds for the antlions were completely new material. Really? Starting with an almost blank canvas, we drew inspiration from the behavior of the antlions to inform their sound design. Since the antlions attack in waves, it seemed reasonable to us that they communicated and organized into groups for attack. This idea led us to incorporate complex insect-like clicking sounds, the final version of which began as recordings of European starlings, which turned out huh. to provide more variation and character than insect recordings. Here, you can hear the original European starling sounds. Interesting. We took those recordings and layered them with designed elements to create the antline sounds used in the game. Good to know. If Kiwo played Euro Truck Simulator, she would be Lori Enforcer. <laughs> Good one. Can you understand the speaker voiceover? No. It's. It, like, it's really hard for me to understand native speakers, but I remember one time I felt really proud was I was watching a video of some astronauts in the uh, International Space Station, and there was an American there, native, well, native English speaker American, that was speaking Russian, and I could actually understand almost every word that he said. I was like, whoa. So... You know, that's that's me, is like I'm a native English speaker, American that learned a little bit of Russian, so it's like I can understand when Americans speak a little bit of Russian. I mean more than when a native speaker speaks it. But I think that's the same with any language. Alright. You go, guys! Ooh. 
Woo! Clap, clap, clap. Generally easier to understand what other non-natives are saying. Oh, hey, I can help you guys out. Why are you fighting me? Excuse me, combine. Hello, hello. Not fair, they're suddenly in alliance with each other. Losers. Okay, now I don't like you anymore. That's right. Easy. Oh, that's right, I don't have much ammo for this. Oh! Oh, my eye itches. Um, interesting thing is that the, you know, the Combine have a lot of, well, first of all, how do I get over this? Here we go. Uh, the Combine have a lot of their, their own words for various things. Okay, hold on to that thought. Oh god. One of you? No! Swear to God. can shoot the thorax area, abdomen area, whatever, um, before the legs are completely off. That's good to know. I was going to say, it's kind of interesting that the Combine have a lot of different words for various things in the universe. Uh, like they have parasitic for head crab, they have necrotic for zombie, and for... They don't have a specific word for antlions. I mean, they do just say, like, bugs sometimes, but they also say exogen. And let me double check that that's correct with my notes.
Oh wait, they say virome. Okay, maybe they do have a specific word. Virome? But the thing that's weird though is that they have the word exogen for vortigaunts. So that's the weird one is exogen. They don't it, that's not a specific word to talk about vortigaunts, it just means some non human thing, exogen, like an out some species that came from outside of this planet is called an exogen. And then they also have biotic to specify a non-combine living thing. So like a citizen, a rebel would be called a biotic because it's a non-combine thing. But te technically combine would be an exogen. But they don't refer to each other as that. So it's just weird that there's like a lot of different terminology for similar things and there's overlap among all of those as well. How did he even get up there to begin with? Maybe because Vortigaunts are from the border world Zen? Well, it's exogenic, not Xenic or, or whatever. I think Zen is just the human word for that planet. I don't think Combine call that world Zen. When I think about it, I don't think there's a single line of dialogue in all of the Half-Life games where the Combine call it Zen. I think that's just something that the science team made up in Black Mesa. I think just the root word Zen, like in the word xenophobic, it just means like something other than yourself. I guess that's just kind of why they called it Zen, is like, well, it's something other than Earth, so call it Zen. And I don't think the Vortigons call themselves their own world Zen, either. Animation Interactable. In traditional games, analog oh. controls like levers, dials, and crank wheels is cool. usually play simple animations in response to a player's mouse click or key press. In VR, however, players with tracked hand oh, cool. controllers expect to be able to control analog Look interfaces by grabbing and moving them directly. To support this, we developed a new system that we call Anim Interactables. The opening mechanism of this health station is a good example of an Anim Interactable. To your left and right, you can see some more examples, such as a large railroad switch, the Vortigaunt's fire alarm doorbell, a crank wheel, a rolling cabinet door, and both the antenna and tuning dial on the radio. Anim interactables like these allow us to give the player control of analog interfaces while constraining their input to an authored range of motion. The system uses the position and orientation of the player's hand to drive the animation of a model oh. which defines the analog interface. As the player moves their tracked controller, the Anim Interactable continuously performs a search to determine if playing the animation forward or backward will place the interaction point closer to the tracked controller's position in space. Uh. This allows the player to drag the animation forward, backward, or hold it stationary. The result is an intuitive correspondence between the player's body and the virtual interface. Furthermore, these interactive animations don't necessarily have to make physical sense. Artists simply animate the range of motion they want the player to be able to control. These Anim Interactables have their debug visualizations turned on, so you can see the authored range of motion, including the nonlinear paths used on the railroad switch, the health station, and the crank wheel. Anim Interactables allowed us to make all kinds of objects in the world interactive, from mundane, man-made devices 
to intricate combine mechanisms without the need to run complex physical simulations. Feel free to play around with the Anim Interactables in this area before moving on. That's really cool seeing what happens. And I also noticed that it's only taking into account the movement of one hand. Even though I have two hands, if I lift my left hand and then grab again, it's whatever the most recent one to grip. So like I'm moving my right hand and it's not doing anything. So it's only whatever the most recent one to grip is. Another really important thing to notice is how there's like a lag behind when you move things. Because the green circle is what my controller is actually doing. It's like whipping around like crazy. And the red one is what the physics system is using to actually interact with the world. And that's how you give things weight in VR. Um, like that's why it's always so awkward when you have like a big, really long thing like a sword or a baseball bat. It, like Beat Saber is a good example. In VR, there's no weight to anything you're holding, so when you have a really long object in your hand, it's just sort of like, it looks extremely shaky because even the most subtle movements are reflected in that long thing. Because normally in real life, the weight of an elongated object would stabilize it and it'd be putting a lot of pressure like on your wrist and stuff and it, it smooths it out. So the way that that simulated, that weight is simulated in VR is by having your movement have a lag behind it to make it feel heavier. And I wish they had like a giant box or something. Like, is this going to show off here? No. Like here, like I'm moving my hands up and down really rapidly, but in VR it doesn't look too intense how much I'm moving it, but it gives you the feeling that it's a very heavy object. So cool. Nice. All right, well, let's see. So I might as well use this. Sorry. Oh, maybe we... Oh, wait, uh... Do the Combine refer to Zen, period? No, I don't think the Combine have ever said the word Zen. Just call them, like, exogens. Just things from outside of the current world. Has anyone made a mod that adds floppy arms between your center and the hands? What do you mean, floppy arms? Oh, I mean, like, putting... Showing more of your body. Uh, well, actually, I heard that a lot of your body in Half-Life Alex is actually stimulated. You just don't see it. And that's in order for them to allow you to stab uh, the health syringes into, like, your arm, even though you don't see an arm. Oh, that's cool. never noticed that. Whoa. Uh... So that it actually responds to like doing your neck and your chest or like your legs and all of that. So I guess they could like put the rest of your body in. And you know, having played VR chat where I'm using avatars all the time that show your full body, that it is pretty weird and it doesn't add a whole lot. Like I, I forget that I only have my hands visible in here. That's something that people who, who haven't played VR often uh, don't understand. Is, uh... That... Showing the rest of your body doesn't make it more immersive. Like, people were complaining, like, well, why are they only showing Alex's hand? That looks so dumb. It's gotta feel dumb in VR, it actually feels better to only see your hand.
sneaky trap. Doesn't quite sound like pills. Oh, this sounds more like pills. Also sounds like something chewing. Patient test. Take one capsule. Capsule by... Whoa. Take one capsule by mouth. Three times only. This is way easier for you guys to read than for me. I can't tell what the rest of it says. Huh. Oh yeah. Grabbing pills. Yeah, the br your brain just fills in the blanks for your arms, yeah. Pills here! Ooh, I love this view. Prison. What now? Wait, Dad, what? It's not a vault. It's a prison. They didn't build it to keep us out. They tried to keep something in. Keep what in? I don't know. I'm not sure if this data part even knows. But they got something trapped in there. Okay, so if it's not a weapon, are we still doing this? The Disney the way I vault. See it, whatever's in there doesn't like the combine very much, so we got that in common. True. So, are we still doing this? We've come this far. I say we keep going. And if you find out it's something we really shouldn't mess with, we'll call it off. That's my girl. I'll let you know what I find out. waste bullets on those things, but they are really annoying. Sometimes large chunks of a level are shifted around or reordered as we work on the game. That's the case for this entire area and the Turner puzzle it's centered around. In fact, for much of its existence, this area didn't even have a home anywhere in the game. It was originally built just to help prototype the Turner puzzle mechanic. Over the course of a few months, the raw gameplay mechanics of Turner puzzles were developed and playtested in a series of small test levels. Each test level explored a single gameplay concept. Those were things like using the Turner puzzle to draw the player's eyes to something interesting, such as Zen Flora and Fauna, creating moments of surprise when an enemy headcrab popped out of a vent, or requiring the player to thread their arm and hand in behind pipes or other tight spaces. Once we figured out which of these ideas were working well, we combined them into a single test level with a toner puzzle that strung all these concepts together in one single puzzle. Further playtesting in this level made us confident that toner puzzles should be included in the game, and we started adding them into other areas. But we didn't include the test level itself anywhere in the game. Huh. It wasn't until later that it became apparent that the zoo was in need of a pace break. We pay careful attention to player fatigue when we playtest, and look for cases where a puzzle or some exploration and resource gathering can be used to give the player a break from combat. There was such a need toward the end of the zoo level, and thankfully in this case we were able to make use of the Turner prototype level that had already been built. Nice.
Oh, you notice that the index controllers, having them strapped to my hands for this long of a period. Let's see how long have I been going? Six and a half hours so far? Uh, they do start to get sore. They, and I have to have them pretty tight on my hands for this game because of all the throwing that I do. I don't want to accidentally whip it across the room. Loud, I hate these things. What am I even trying to do here? I want to get this this door open. I have to cut power to it. What is this doing? Just going up and over to the light. This is going to the green cable. Green cable goes all the way. Wait, where does this go? Oh, green cable forks? It goes all the way to there. So... Yeah, I remember this puzzle being pretty difficult. What's going on up here again? Okay, this goes to the blue cable. Do I want to just cut power to the blue cable? Does that do anything? Where does the blue go? Is this something I want to touch? No? Is anything to interact with over here? If only Gordon were here, we'd be able to get into this vent, get into the next room. Understanding what I'm doing here. Like, what is. Oh, this is the green thing.
green just connects to that. I just want to... If I just turn everything on... Shut up. We got things sparking. Can I do anything with this? Can't reach over there. Oh, there's this. Oh my god. Oh, that's cool. Job nerd. Death Stranding is near. Before we read the whiteboard, ha. Huh. Fancy zombie entrance. <laughs> Tiger. Tiger's hiding a secret. Anyway, Bridges confirmed the Half-Life universe and the Death Stranding universe are all one universe or the same. Now try to connect all those dots. Here's the saddest part. If here, go home. No more animals. Brown. Thanks for the follow, Maddo Scientisto. Max Jane Ollie. Thanks for the follow, Sleepy Shaman. Yeah, I, th I was hoping the Easter egg would be more exciting than that, but it's still cool. Oh, there is a head crab in Death Stranding now. You can wear it as a hat. I think it was because uh, Gabe met with Kojima and gave him an index, and Kojima really praised Half-Life Alex for the version that they had available. There's rumors that there might be some kind of Kojima VR related experience in the works because Kojima Productions are definitely still working on stuff
Oops. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. 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 There, whatever, it's me. And I'll just like want to wash my hands. After seeing this, like, oh. Oh. Is this whiteboard a low-key reference to people refusing to evacuate during the catastrophe because they don't want to stop working? Could be. Yeah, let me just draw something. Glass shatters. <gasps> Surprise! Whoa! I'll take that. Trying to throw the tiger at me. Jeez, how many shots he take? This little scene. Got a lion that's living, and you got a or a tiger, and then a dead one, and then a living one, and then a dead one, and then a living one. What does it mean? Oh, look at that lighting. Beautiful. This isn't actually a zombie, this is just a regular drunk person. See the bottle in their, in their hand? Suffering right enough already, just gonna leave them be. It's hard to get plastic figures to stand up properly. What is this art? Whoa. Cool, whatever it is. Delicious. Hey, you wanna try one? Wanna try some human food? When we decided to resurrect our toner prototype level for use as a pacing break in the zoo, we had the opportunity to make some improvements and integrate elements that hadn't existed when we had first experimented with the toner mechanic. For example, the newly developed explosive Zen bloaters were added at various points along the puzzle to surprise players and remind them that they need to keep an eye out for these hazards. Also, in the intervening months, the toner mechanic itself had evolved from one where players merely push a ball of energy along a path to one which included branching paths and rotating junctions. This junction here in the breaker box is the linchpin of the whole puzzle, as the player must interact with it three times, once to open the roller door to this back area, once to switch power away from the roller door to the last leg of the puzzle, and once to reopen the roller door in order to exit. Because this toner puzzle covers such a large physical area, including some zombie combat in the middle, players frequently lost track of the correspondence between the state of this junction and the roller door. This meant that they would trap themselves back here and not understand how to proceed. To address this, we made a lot of changes to the presentation of this junction over the course of development. The unique breaker box and tangle of conduit are designed to make the junction recognizable as the same junction from both sides of the wall. 
The shape of the hole in the wall and the orientation of the breaker box are designed to make sure that the player stands in the right location to have line of sight to the roller door and see that it closes when they route power away from it to the last leg of the puzzle. The door itself also makes a lot of noise and an unreasonable amount of sparks to draw attention to itself each time it moves. This particular puzzle twist was in danger of being cut for a long time, but with this series of refinements, enough playtesters understood its behavior that we were comfortable with shipping it in the final game. Nice. Oh, come on, Scout. I guess I'll just leave you right here. Now this is tea. This is chai. All right. Get this puzzle over with. I'm just going to inject the drug. Stuff those grenades down my wrist holes. Okay, I remember this one being a long one. Uh, so... trying to turn everything off so that I can get that door open. So that's why they strategically put that there. Uh... So... Sorry, TV. Oh, not these guys. things so much. I don't want to shoot because then I'll alert the zombie that I want to just be able to hang out, chill. Barnacle, today's your lucky day. Come on. <laughs> he was worth keeping that barnacle alive. Uh, Black Mesa was supposed to be in New, New Mexico, right? Why does it take place in the Eastern Bloc? Uh, well... Right in the beginning of Half-Life Alex, there's a globe and all of the United States is just completely X'd off vigorously with a big black X. So presumably by the time Half-Life Alex happens, the US is just absolutely fucked and is just not able to be recovered. And I don't know if it's considered canon, probably not, but Opposing Force, sort of Half-Life 1's expansions, told us that the military nuked Black Mesa in order to try to contain the problem. 
the whole facility itself is completely gone. And I assume that the military went through similar measures in order to contain other parts of the country. So the U.S. is probably just totally gone. So at some point in the history of the timeline, I'm guessing lots of people left the U.S. and went over to Europe and probably Asia and other places <coughs> to escape the U.S. And then, yeah, Half-Life 2, we see that there's Black Mesa East, which is uh, Eli's lab based in Eastern Europe. Isn't City 17 like the capital of the world now? Breen is the leader and he's there. I guess so. Thanks for the follow, Muffin Street. That's where the Citadel is. Uh, yeah, kind of the base of Operation Combine on the Earth. But Otacon is still in Black Mesa. True. Implied there's more cities all over, but lots of people brought the City 17 because it's safer here. Yeah, I would really like to know what other cities are like ones that aren't the center of attention. Alright, stay safe, zombie. I hope you get your, uh... Okay, okay, but I hope you get your drinking problem under control. Congratulations, sir. God, I have to do this. Wait, 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 wait. wait is that open the door? Oh no, I can see the door closed over there, okay. There we go. Oh. Actually, my controller is probably charged enough. I'm gonna be able to stand again. Not a fan of sitting too much in VR. They're too hot. That's an understatement. Oh, he's coming. Oh no. Oh no, zombie friend, no. Oh. You bastard. Ow. Ow, that hurt. Well, I'm sorry, dude. I tried. Oh, everything's tangled again.
Yeah, Nova Prospect's a pretty good place to hang out. Really gives you a new outlook on life. Nova Prospect. Vortigaunt, I can feel your power. Sing to me. A good touch would have been for your controllers to vibrate when you had your hands on these so you could like feel their, their resonating force of the vortescence. these things. Big containers. Reminds me of the first Ninja Turtles movie with the, with the ooze. It's all the way to here. You have these different like number codes. And then it goes into like these containers, which feed over to these bigger containers. Fascinating. It's probably just tastes like uh, like orange juice or tang. Okay, we're getting pretty close, close-ish to the end. Some of the biggest fights in the game are coming up here. Man, this area must have taken a while to decorate. Seven AM going almost seven hours. Wait, this happened last night too, where I somehow managed to without even thinking about it, start the stream at almost exactly the time I did the last time I streamed, because I reached the seven hour mark at almost the same time that it was seven AM here. Amazing. Such a cool thing. If I poke this body, it's gonna like jump. Well, it awoken. It awakened. Okay, I got on microphone cable. There we go. Alright. When I originally played this game, this whole part was so laggy. It was hard to fully enjoy it, so this is my first time seeing this scene um, with no lag. What a what a thrill! Dun, 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 dun. Good luck trying to lock out someone wielding an Alex. Yeah. Good luck. Jeez. Three left. Oh, I gotta save this.
How am I able to do seven hours in VR? Fourteen hours is my record of continuous uh, uh, hours in VR. And that was playing uh, Please Don't Touch Anything in VR. No breaks or anything. I was standing the whole time during the 14 hours, too. I don't know. I just really enjoy it. I just don't feel like I need to take a break. Even when I reached the 14 hours, it wasn't like I was almost dead or anything. It was just like... I don't know. It was nice. It just surprised me how long it was. Like, I didn't feel like that. I'm very grateful to be able to do that. Whoa! Russell! Forge just took down the last substation! Oh, let me see! Eli! The Forge just took down the last substation! Brace yourself, Alex! It's gonna come down! What the? So head towards those beams, right? Right. That's gonna be the backup station. Critical breach. Stand bomb. Stand bomb. I hope whoever's in there is worth it. What's that, Alex? Nothing. I'm on my way. God, it's still chills-inducing. Watching, like, really large-scale things happen. And also my room, I have the air conditioning blowing on me and the fan. It's like really breezy in my room right now. It just feels like how this area would probably feel at the moment. Just in case I need a thumbnail, I gotta like, okay, let's what if, do it like this. Well, like. The emergence from the zoo gave us an opportunity to present players with a dramatic vista and to show them how much progress they had made in the journey to the vault. This was challenging because the vault's position in the world was already determined to be above the parking garage, which the player would reach at the end of the map. The but placing itself, the vault right? correctly in support of that location left the vault looking too distant to create the dramatic view we wanted here. We also intended to portray the cutting of the vault's power cables by the Vortiguns at this point, but having this take place at such a distant location was unclear and confused playtesters. The solution was to move everything closer. The vault looked more imposing looming above the player, and the effects of the Vortigant's cable cutting efforts were much clearer. All we needed then was a conceit to justify the two vault locations. The location here at the start of the map, and the eventual location at the end of the map. Around this same phase of development, we were in the process of defining exactly how the player would bring down the vault, and our solution to that problem also helped justify the two vault locations. Tractor beams are a familiar cliché in science fiction and often share a common visual style of an enveloping force field emitted net-like from a single point. Using a tractor beam as a combined failsafe device to catch the vault served us well here. It allowed us to prevent Alex from being crushed by the vault dropped out of the sky when the Vortigaunts cut the final power cable and it gave us a satisfactory mechanism for moving the vault to the location we needed it to be at the end of the map. Throughout the map, the beam itself also serves as a beacon ensuring that the players are always able to recognize their new goal, the tractor beam control station. I still get motion sick and strained easily, unfortunately. I can get knocked out as little as 30 to 45 minutes, really. So technically it's not motion sickness, it's simulation sickness, or VR sickness, or sim sickness. It's the opposite of motion sickness. Motion sickness is when your body is moving your eyes don't think so. Sim sickness is when your eyes think you should be moving, but your body isn't. They both give similar feelings, but they're caused by different things. I had a lot of trouble with this part when I first played. I remember this is like the longest fight for me, but maybe... Now, with more FPS than ever, I'll be able to get through this. I'm on hard mode, also. Sim sickness is when you bought too many early access games or electronic arts games. Now we need a VR vestibular system simulator. Exactly. Alright. 
Uh, oh, this needs to be reloaded. And I intentionally have not updated most of my guns. They just have a couple update upgrades. Combine, help! Not like that. Alex? Alex, you still there? Okay, I'm off to a terrible start. Okay, now I remember I gotta run across so that the Combine can take out the Antlions and I can just keep going so I don't have to sit here and kill all of them. Sim sickness is when you buy every DLC from the Sims game, exactly. And then like 40 people leave the stream. Oh, this is how it's going to be? Yeah, I'm not watching this guy. This guy sucks. There is a button you can push or at least a slide. I just keep forgetting. I'm just not a gun dude. There we go. how the music ducks down a little bit, but it's not totally gone. I do have to get rid of these guys because they become a pain in the ass if you leave them alive. I remember. shouldn't use this ammo. T 
Alright, I seem to remember there being a lot of ammo hidden around here. I'm going to save right after I collect everything that's here. I'll take that. I'll take this. Us. So is the contrivance, are they going with, the, explain why these ant lines are so slow, the half like two ant lines printed at you. <clears throat> well, there's a big gameplay reason why they're slower. Uh, I, I don't think they're really going to explain why they change. It could just be a different species. Like, maybe they mutated differently, or something like that. Because they don't look as much like the ones that we see in Half-Life 2. The Half-Life 2 ones are, like, bright yellow and much lighter colored, and they don't glow in the dark like these do. There's somebody up there. Never. That's not Combine. Maybe a scavenger? I never Be careful. Never noticed that before, huh? Part's pretty cool. The final twist of the game presented quite a few storytelling challenges for the writers. The game is long, much longer than a movie, and the surprise reveal of the G-Man at the end felt almost whoa, impossible whoa, to whoa. sustain over the entire experience. Everyone on the team assumed that through basic deduction, most players are going to figure it out along the way. So the solution, like in most good stories, was to just add more stuff, more details, more questions, and more nooks and crannies to the plot. The writers quickly realized that there was one big distracting name, Gordon Freeman, they would pull the player's attention away from any theories they may be cooking up on their own. We then realized that we could use the absence of the G-Man in the story, in the eerie parallels between the G-Man and Gordon's experiences at Black Mesa, to redirect player attention and propel the story towards the final act. If the player thought they had uncovered a new mission, to save Gordon Freeman from stasis, then the twist at the end could be secure. To pull it off, the writers created a new, mysterious character, a scientist collaborating with the Combine. This addition came late in the project, so the writers relied on another tried-and-true tact. Base the character on an actor we're fond of, and then do our absolute best to cast and record with that person. The chosen actor had to struck a particular tone with the writers. 
She has an easy in-command confidence and a smooth southern Missouri drawl. This not only sets her apart from the other characters in the Half-Life universe, but makes the character easy to hear on the page, which is incredibly important when time is short at the end of the project. And once she was in the studio, her pitch-perfect performance assured us that we'd made the correct decision. Of course, then the scene still had to be built. Level designers figured out what existing chunk of level track could be bumped out to fit the scene. The area we chose previously held some barnacles and a few light puzzle elements which the designers weren't upset to lose. The level track had to be altered to funnel you into a place where the scene could unfold and the player could eavesdrop without getting a good look at the character. This served two purposes. One was that it would benefit the mystery for the scene to feel furtive and for the identity of the character to remain secret, but also we could shroud the performance and the intricate facial animation necessary to bring a character to life, all in shadow, for the animators and the choreographers. Like in a lot of cases, not doing the work was the correct thing for both the story and our tight shipping schedule. Here we go, that's probably the most intriguing of all of the commentary you've heard so far. You really thought this was Mossman when he first played. Kind of sad that it's not, apparently. It really does seem like Mossman. Uh, she was originally supposed to have a way bigger role. Yeah, there's a lot of characters that had a whole bunch of development done with them, and they... Uh, uh, yeah, but then they changed it a bunch. Um, in the making of this game, they really point out over and over the fact that there was a gigantic story revision very late in the process so it's no mystery that there is tons of revisions to characters and stuff like that and they said that if it wasn't for that story revision uh that happened late in development that the game would not have been as successful or as as satisfying to the player base like they brought in um people that no longer worked at valve they brought in, what is it, like, Jay Pinkerton or something, who was the lead writer on Portal. Brought him back in. Uh, didn't bring Mark Laidlaw back in, unfortunately, but the the original creator of the Half-Life story. But a lot of extremely talented people that, like, that, like saved the game. So it's not Mossman. I'm pretty sure it's not. There was, so you should go on YouTube, go to uh, Tyler McVicker or Valve News Network or whatever. He has a video where he has talked to a lot of previous people who like worked at Valve or worked on this game. He tries to piece together what the original story of this game was. And I used to remember, I, I know the Vortigaunts had much bigger involvement originally. Uh, and that Eli was going to have a much bigger role in the story as well. I don't remember, but it, it was a lot different than it ended up being right now. Yeah, I always thought it was Rayman. That'd be an interesting crossover. Half-Life and Rayman? No, but he said Ratman. Uh, well, Ratman was, you know, is a dude, but he's the one that helps Shell uh escape aperture in portal 2 and he's like the only scientist that survived aperture i don't really know what ended up happening to him i think the comics kind of described it i think he lived after she escaped okay well here's a continuation of this part oh yeah i do remember that uh, Tyler also interviewed a woman that worked on AR stuff at Valve. And now they're working on their own, like, tabletop AR game. It has nothing to do with Valve, but it's a pretty interesting approach. Alright, here we go. Setting the scene. Uh, hi. Okay, Wait. great. Finally. Hi. We need to leave the box, or this thing going to be Black Mesa all over again. Well, now I'm telling you it is right. Look, if it's still here when she gets there, he's gone. 
What in the history of today makes you think you're Miss Delta? Look who she's talking to. This guy we've got in there survived Black Mesa. He raised holy hell and then just disappeared. We finally caught him and you're just going to let him go again? Move the box. Talking to an advisor. Survived Black Mesa, then disappeared. Eli, they do have a super weapon. God damn it, Russ, they got Gordon Freeman. Oh, wow. That's good, right? This is very, very good. This is a miracle. All right. So, let's go save Gordon Freeman. Oh, incoming. Hey, give me a second. Damn it. Scripted grenade, I can't do anything about it. It's hard. I, I know I've said that a million times, I know. Yeah, how is she communicating to the advisor? I guess that the advisors are a point, one of the most like mysterious parts of the combine. We really don't know much about them at all. I think their advisors are supposed to be like the purest form of combine. They're just slugs. Let's go save Gordon Freeman. Oh, incoming. Hey, give me a second. It's interesting, it doesn't even let me shoot the, uh, the tank on the back. It wasn't even highlighted as a target. He just ca said that I'm a low value... He just said that I'm a low value target. So it's so rude. Oh my god. The exact Alex. Alex, you still there? Exact same thing happened again. God damn it. Okay, I'm just gonna throw a grenade right back at the ordinal immediately, just to get that out of the way, so I'm not sitting here doing the same shit again. True, Breen did talk to the advisors in plain English. Let's go save Gordon Freeman. Oh, incoming. Hey, give me a second. Oh, a scanner comes by. <laughs> I'm telling. All right. So the plan is to get to that control room and get Gordon. I'll be honest, people talk about him a lot, but I was just... Are you kidding Alex? me? That happened to me before. Alex. Oh, tiny little hole in the ground that instantly kills you. That happened during my original playthrough as well. How is that still a thing? It's like she's talking in a cutscene after you've just had a fight. Why would they put a stupid little hole in the ground that instantly kills you? Like, that is just so okay, against... So the plan is to get to that control room and get Gordon. <laughs> I'll be honest, people talk about him a lot, but... I always just assumed he was dead. Me too. Hey, Dad. 
Are you there? Yeah, what's up, Alex? If Gordon survived Black Mesa, where's he been? I don't know, but I bet it's a hell of a story. Do I still have the vodka bottle? No. Yeah, why is that hole there? I don't know. It is so stupid. It feels like just an oversight. Where did she go anyway? I guess she must have just left out of that back room. Okay. Ah. Oh, this is why I can't go through here. There really no grub? Wait, 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 wait. Oh, well that's cool too. Why don't they know he went to Zen? Uh... I don't think anyone knows that Gordon went to Zen. Not at this point yet. Because Black Mesa was destroyed after he left. Uh... Oh no, Vortigaunts were aware that he fought the Nihilin and freed them. I guess they don't know. I mean, I think as far as people know, Gordon went to Zen and did something that freed the Vortigaunts, and then he never came back. So maybe that's why they're confused about where he went. It's because he never returned, because uh, G. Manius Maximus put him into the stasis. The purpose of this hideout was to give players a nice reward for being observant and exploring the environment. We wanted to highlight the story of scavengers living behind the quarantine wall, what their lives might look like, and why they might choose to live there. The person who lived here was referred to internally as the Combine Killer, imagined as a person with a grudge against the Combine who has chosen to eke out a living in the quarantine zone, spending their time exacting revenge on unsuspecting Combine patrols, perhaps eventually joining the organized resistance movement portrayed in Half-Life 2. True, true. I thought this might have been the room of the collaborator woman. This is interesting that there's just like pieces of combine uniforms. You get a real good detailed look at these things that interface directly into their eye holes. Mister of Gods, thank you for the follow. God, I love the detail. Just examining things in VR is so fun. And now this is the smallest object, and I was blown away that you could actually 
pick this up. God. You can pick up a single screw. Like, there's no reason to even need to do this. But I, I feel like they did it just to show off. Get to get a good look at Alex's, like, dirty fingernails, too. Which I'm glad her fingernails are disgusting. I mean, they should be in this situation. I'm glad they didn't feel the need like a lot of game devs like well it's a female protagonist she's got to be just sexy and she's got to be you know have be all made up and cute looking with painted nails like no 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 she's got to be disgusting because it's a disgusting world looking at you uh half-life 2 cinematic mod that just absolutely ruined alex's character Reminds me of ducks. A yeah, fully modeled. Oh, yeah. One of these. 9 volt battery. Only 90s kids know what these are. I think there was a unique book or magazine that could be found over here. Oh. oh yeah, this is it. Black Mesa. White Lies. Look at that. You can see like embossed or imprinted or whatever in the cover. Is an all-seeing eye with the Black Mesa logo as the pupil. By Dr. Jonas Allard? The occult secrets at the heart of the world's most secretive research facility. Look, they had an insider. Oh man. Stop it! <laughs> uh, so secretive that all employees must undergo rigorous background checks. So self-sufficient it has its own sanitation departments and hydroelectric power generator. This Black Mesa Research Facility an innocent facility engaged in the pursuit of science or the uh the invocation of babylonian prophecy merging quantum and occult math to open an interdimensional portal between our world and another at once that portal is opened what will come through the other side dr jonas allard is a renowned paranormal researcher and the author of cern gateway to babylon Damn. Why can't I put this in my wrist hole? Save this book for later. <laughs> yes, penis plants. That pulsate when I get near, it excites them. Yeah, th that book is the, uh, this is the half-life equivalent of Lusty Argonian Maid. It's like the naughty side of the, the lore that they don't want you to see. Anyway... Uh. 
I like how he's just smacking the thing. Uh, I need a piece of debris. Here. Oh, come on. Pretty sure that's just blood that they're milking, and it's not actually antlion milk. Kidding me? Time for the uh, VIP elevator. Oh. This time he won't have to do it alone. Okay. Interesting combine dialogue coming up here. Because there's a concept within Combine lore that they call cognitive dissonance. And it's anytime they think about or communicate something other than their duty to serve as a Combine soldier. And some of the dialogue that you hear between Combine is they'll say, resolving cognitive dissonance, 
resolved. So they'll admit that they have thought or done something other than fulfill their orders and their brains can be remotely brainwashed to go back to a default state that is exclusively their own orders to serve as the Combine. But this scene is very strange because it's a group of Combine soldiers just openly talking like normal people, which just makes me think that it's like, how does that happen? I feel like that's a long process of being involved with like non-Combine that would even allow you to kind of reconsider the world around you and question your own orders. This is like significant moment that happens here. It's very weird. Why would they even question that it's dangerous or not safe or anything like that? It's just so out of what they would do. <laughs> oh, something like that. I guess I just delivered the uh, cognitive dissonance memory wipe. But I shot the hand grenade that was on his vest. Oh, here we go. This one's about you, chat. Maybe their conditioning isn't as strong because they're lower tier. Could be. Yeah, this one's about chat. In recent years, video game streaming has become one of the main ways that players engage with the culture of games, and this is even more true for VR titles, Disgusting. where players who do not have VR equipment want to participate. To address this audience, we created a spectator HUD, which displays the VR player's health, ammunition, resin, and the contents of their wrist pockets. I disabled that. This information is overlaid on the 3D scene in the desktop window, and lets viewers track the state of the player's resources, nope. without having to rely on the player to look at their wrist or open up a menu. The spectator HUD started off as a tool used by the development team to display resources, as well as the state of controller buttons and other diagnostic information. An interesting side effect of this HUD was that it made playtests way more exciting to watch because we as an audience had information the player wasn't necessarily aware of. For example, playtest observers might realize that a player had barely survived an encounter when the players themselves had never even checked their health. We even saw cases where players killed an enemy with their very last bullet without realizing it themselves. Huh. The highs and lows we felt watching our own playtests were something that we wanted to share with the streaming audience and it's been exciting to see streamers using it in the wild. Streamers. Huh. In recent years, video game streaming has become out of one my of head. the main ways that players engage with the culture. Get out of, of my head. Ugh. Ah, yeah. Oh, 
Oh, I remember not liking this part. Okay, that went a lot faster than I remember it going. Three songs left. But I do remember an important part of that is to not wake this guy up, whose secrets have been revealed by my reflex sight, because that shows that he's actually still alive. And that pose doesn't look natural. doing to Gordon Freeman in there? That's a good question. Are they, you know, sucking his brain out? I think they're gonna move him off world. Well, either way, let's not find out. I'll get there before it happens. been a fun device to design. Yeah, the logic behind this room is really kind of weird. So, if I... I seem to remember the first time I played through this that I just threw a grenade in here and then climbed up and waited at the top, and I failed. But, if you go back to the top... <laughs> and shoot it from up here suddenly everything's okay like no you have to do it the way we want you to do it if I'm remembering this puzzle correctly then everything's fine. <laughs> Uh-oh, this water is suspended in the air. How mysterious. The explosion was so intense that it like tore apart space time.
You went through it dismantling all the lasers? Are you sure we're thinking of the same room? I don't think you can dismantle these, as far as I'm aware. think you're going, mister? That's what I thought. All this conversation's interesting. Rest What's the deal with the crowbar? Oh, you mean Gordon Freeman's crowbar? Yeah. Oh, Alex. He fought his way out of Black Mesa with nothing but that crowbar. No way. It's true. Well, it's true that that's what they say. You know, nobody knows for sure. Well, when I get him out, let's give him a gun. Yes, uh, not mine. I'm out of the gun lending business. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh... Wait a minute. Will I actually come all the way back here for that? Huh. Yeah, it is significant that uh, this shows how the stories about Freeman are being twisted and exaggerated by people who weren't there to see it, yeah. Oh, I forgot about this part. Wait, so I... Did I totally miss something in that room? I know there's that hanging here. That needs a power cell. Is there a power cell in this room? Okay. Given some more freaky, like, antlion SM going on in there. Well, I don't want to upgrade my weapons anymore, so I guess I don't really need to come into here. Well, 
this is available now, so I guess I might as well do this. Barely even used you. Alright, now... Okay. Nah, I don't need the hard hat. I, I just got the skills. I'm worried about my controller batteries again. Oh. Creating a climactic battle that capped off the antlion combat proved to be a challenging design problem. We wanted to create a sustained combat experience that was substantial enough to challenge players who had refined their skills against the antlions. But simply throwing a large number of antlions at the player all at once was not a particularly engaging experience, nor was it compatible with our established combat balancing. Rather than containing the player in a restricted space and spawning waves of enemies, we wanted to keep the player engaged and moving through a gauntlet of constant pressure toward a goal. Oh to do this, we needed an arena with a clear linear flow and a porous layout that would allow the player to maintain sight of their goal while being flanked by swarms of antlions as they moved toward it. This tanker yard, which we had originally built for a narrative scene that was cut from the game, had the properties huh. we were looking for. The long tanker cars lead toward the intended direction of travel, and their positioning requires the player to pay careful attention to their sides and rear as they advance. The combine tractor beam tower is framed at the end of the tracks, providing a clear goal for the player. The placement of the glowing red sign in the direction of the tractor beam was also a deliberate decision a technique used by the environment artist to subconsciously pull players mm. in the desired direction via visual contrast, even in the event that they've momentarily lost their bearings in the chaos of the battle. The pacing of the combat here was carefully balanced to leave most playtesters on the brink of being overwhelmed and feeling like they made it through by just the skin of their teeth. It took many iterations of enemy placement, ammo and item placement, and player path adjustments to achieve this balance. We ultimately settled on a design that featured a steady stream of advancing antlions, with antlion spitters placed at the far end of the space applying enough pressure to prevent players from rushing toward the goal. Combine soldiers up on the raised platforms divert player attention to the right-hand flank and provide verticality oh, and target prioritization. Thanks for reminding me. To the sense of frenzy we sought to create. Oh boy. I do remember there's like a shit ton of ammo at the end of this, so I shouldn't shy too far away from using my good stuff. Yeah, the respirators do work. Area is not even all that long too, but finding out that you need to go along with stressful puzzles and nightmare, like how the mouth covering motion kind of looks like Alex's. Gasping, reacting to the commentary, yeah. Like, oh, what? No. Start out with a pistol and then only go to the SMG once pressure is increased. Which is probably going to be immediately.
right, well... Alex. Here's the next four hours of the stream. VOD watchers uh, skip ahead three hours. Four hours. Uh... You're asking if it's a valid strategy to just damage the antlines enough to slow them down but don't fully kill them to prevent others from spawning? Uh... I don't know. That might be a good idea. How much slower are they really? I guess quite a bit. Alright, I'll save right here. Combine aren't doing much to help. Once they see me, they just like ignore the antlions. God damn it! Trying to get them in position by explosive barrels so I don't use all of my ammo. So I'm running very low.
damn it. that guy go? Oh, now he's coming back. Oh. Thanks for the reminder, dude. Three left. your weakness? Climactic battle that soothing dev voice interrupts the battle. God, how many bullets am I using on this one guy? Good lord. Ooh. Last one. Hey, Russ. You want to swap in here? Yeah, nah, I would probably die instantly. Reading what you guys are saying. Oh yeah, imagine having to carry the gnome all throughout this, yeah. <laughs> nice shooting stance. Uh, I don't know about that. Hmm. 
this puzzle that I got stuck on for so long because I didn't know it was timed. Like, there's no signal right now that I'm supposed to be doing this quickly. Well, it's not timed in the sense like it's gonna not work. It's that like, to finish it, I just have to like click down the row really quickly before it swaps electricity back or something to open it. It was something like that. I guess there is that beeping that happens, but I don't know. It just wasn't clear to me the first time around. Special delivery. You didn't know it was possible to defeat all the antlions. You always went straight for the door and moved through as quickly as possible. Nice. I think you solved that one accidentally. I think I did too on my first run. Breaking and entering. Imagine being so strong that you can just like palm a big metallic barrel like this full of gas. I hear a lot of gunfire, at least I have this for cover. No! Interesting that there's pistol ammo everywhere, yet... None of the people I've encountered, including Combine and all that, use a pistol. So why is there so much ammo for that particular gun? It really makes you think. Where'd it go? Guess I just lost that ammo. Caught you. And potentially you too, Bakers. Oh. <laughs> 
Oh my god. Where? Go quite as planned. <laughs> the, the pistol ammo no clipped. I was the one who got no clipped. No magged. Gordon, where are you when I need you? Like, this is an insult. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I guess that works, too. But I can't climb up there. Oh, weird. I haven't seen this particular face on these characters before. Ah, that's what I'm looking for. Half-Life 1 sound. I love the homage or homage, whatever. Got me. Wait, 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 you got a weak spot. Uh oh. Uh oh. Turn around. Face me. Whoa. What part of him is glowing? It's like... God, just use an absurd amount of bullets. Yeah, I, I remember this part taking a while. Uh, I think I remember what's supposed to happen. Holding a box? Is that for me? 
Oh, thank you. Oh, how kind. Weird that it's showing that he has a weak point. Pistol mag, you know it will be. Uh, well, it is one pistol mag, but and health. That's right, there's this. This sneaky person jerk. and over I guess huh well we shall see
God damn. Chasm puzzle. Explain yourself. The goal of this puzzle was to create a moment of heightened stress by requiring players to deal with a sudden threat after being placed in a precariously disadvantageous position. In the original design of the puzzle, players would stand on a platform which was suspended from a cable and pull themselves across the chasm. Halfway across, antlion spitters would emerge and start attacking. The platform provided limited cover, and players would have to make trade-offs between taking cover and continuing to propel themselves forward. This succeeded in creating the desired spike in intensity, but unfortunately, the lateral movement of the platform caused considerable motion sickness for most playtesters. Wrong Even term. players who were comfortable with the vertical movement of elevators elsewhere in the game were adversely affected here. The puzzle that we shipped retains the same sense of tension due to being stranded in the middle of a chasm under attack, but does not rely on physically moving the player. The upper portion of the wooden platform is deliberately devoid of any substantial cover, which encourages players to jump onto the platforms below. On the lower platforms, we provide enough cover to protect players from antlions, but also oh. leave them feeling vulnerable out in the middle of the chasm. The cover here is porous and breakable, increasing the sense of urgency and requiring players to engage the antlions from their compromised position. Okay, wise guy. Push these buttons, this is a good. We got one of these again. Now the delicious dish soap. I think this. Finish that thought in a sec. Gonna grab all this. Uh, well, I think that vent is the only vent in the game where it actually rewards you for getting down low on the floor and crawling through. I thought I remember hearing about this. So let's see.
Maybe not? I could swear there was one that kind of broke away from regular gameplay and just had you actually crawl on the floor. Hmm, maybe that was somewhere else? Yeah, you can actually crawl into that vent if you do it physically. Well, I'm on the floor in real life. But I must have to actually move in real life too and not use the locomotion. Which I do not have the track space to do. I'm already nearing the end of my space. Ah! Uh, how can I do this? guess if I go diagonally, I would get slightly more space. Use what I learned in math class. Trigonometry. God, this is hard to visualize. Wait, wait, no, I need to go like this so that I can turn diagonally crawl like this no but I'm already uh. oh my god trying to align the real and virtual worlds is quite quite a headache No, I'm art. How do I do this? I have to lube myself up with soap. Mm. Okay, so this is diagonal in real life. I just need to line it up. Now that's diagonal in real life. Okay, I think I got it. Uh. Oh god. I'm almost gonna crash into the wall. Oh, hey. No! Tracking. Okay. I am literally touching my front door right now. Uh, was there any more to it than just a head crab? Oh, Jesus. I saw there was like a like a helmet over there too. Ha! I'll just put you back. Where you came from. Oh, good! Ah! Oh, head cramp! A head cramp on your face! 
Oh, thank God. I'm okay. It was on your face and it, oh, it was disgusting. Yeah, it was. <laughs> All right. Well, that happens earlier in the game, too, so I don't think that was part of the Easter egg. Was there any more to it than that? Huh. Anyway... Just back here. Great. So I don't get it. You just do that? Okay. I don't... that's a weird puzzle, I guess. What is this? Oh, this is an antlion's head? Interesting. Oh, because it was part of this. Okay. Alex, we're getting close to the vault now. You're not going to have many more chances to use your resin. Good point. I'll reason. see if there are any upgrades I can use. I can't believe my pistol's made it this far. I was thinking about giving it to Gordon. Or well, she doesn't. Uh, yeah, I don't want any more upgrades. How many shots does it take? You know what? That is not... I am not going to take that. That was stupid. That's only like the second barnacle I've shot in the whole playthrough. And I only do that because I know there is... A lot of shooting coming up. I don't want to go out there about to die. Alex, we're getting close to the vault now. You're not going to have many more chances to use your resin. Good point. I'll see if there are any upgrades I can use. I can't believe my pistol's made it this far. I was thinking about giving it to Gordon.
Okay, so it's not. have like the leg target oh not glowing orange huh it looked like one of those explosive things Could have led him down to the barnacles, but uh Okay. Just clip through the ground. That was a bad place for that to fall. <sighs> what? What did I do? Jesus. How are you shooting so well? Oh god. viewers fast forward three hours speaking of which i've been streaming almost n nine hours it's almost nine o'clock a.m oh and my controllers are almost dead too let me make sure they're actually charging I'll accidentally yank them out of the wall outlet like I did earlier with, with Jeff. Uh, excuse me, I didn't start the game. Pause. Come on, USB, work with me. Work with me, USB. Why won't you go in? Oh my god, there, Jesus, okay. 
And both of the outlets are unplugged. Or both of the plugs are unplugged. <sighs> Gonna electrocute myself real quick. Okay. All right, they're both orange now. That means they're charging. Anyway. picking up okay Single door put an end to the Combine's reign. <laughs> In cases where the player had to face off against Combine in relatively open spaces like this one, we often found that playtesters would backtrack to safety and attempt to pick away at the soldiers from a distance. <laughs> the playtesters would ultimately be successful in clearing the combat space, but would feel unsatisfied with the encounter due to the repetitive and static nature of the tactics that they employed. To address this, we used a few design tools to discourage this type of player behavior. The placement of the combine suppressor standing on the bed of the truck at the far end of the courtyard here is the key to the design flow of this battle. The suppressor does not move from his planted position on the far side of the courtyard while the player is on the near side. His positioning, combined with his unrelenting wall of suppressing fire, forces the player to advance in order to close the distance required to take him out, we'll see all about while that. under the intense pressure from a carefully crafted combination of other combine units. Additionally, if the player backtracks far enough from the fight, the more mobile combine soldiers in the encounter are told to retreat and hold their ground until the player once again advances into the combat. These elements together keep players moving forward into locations that provide for more interesting opportunities for both the player and the enemy soldiers. Oh, you thought this was me talking? Huh. I wish. All right. Oh, Jesus. Oh. Well, they're not fucking around anymore.
let that wall hammer get too close. Thought the grenade would have taken him out. Why am I not hearing any game sound? What the hell happened? The hell? Why is it so quiet? If that fixes it. Alright, good. Well, no, it's gone again. Well, some of it. Like, all the ambient sound is gone. Sucks. That was a bad move. Three left. Ambient sound, come back. That was fun. Yeah, it'll probably come back. In cases where the player had to face off. Well, that's right, there was some commentary up that way. Let me go check this out first. might come in useful. Oh, I accidentally unplugged the USB cable. Where did you go? Where did you come from? Where did you go? USB cable -o.
plugged into the wall, I can't throw as much. These just don't stay plugged in. They just like put duct tape on them to hold them into the wall. The power strip. Okay. Just notice these containers are full of hazardous waste. Uh, federal law prohibits improper disposal of found contact the nearest police. Oh, I should call this in. Handle with care. Combine are going to be in real trouble. And report them. Uh, there was a commentary thing. Oh, there it is. Verticality. After the intense combat that precedes it, this tower initially serves as a pacing break before once again ramping up the intensity on the player's final fight up to the combine tractor beam controls. While the lower portion of the tower does contain combat, it has been designed to cause players to engage with the space in a different way than the preceding courtyard fight. The focus here is on navigating the chaotic verticality of the tower, which we found to be particularly successful for playtesters to experience in VR. The manhacks that initially engage the player from above fly a path that deliberately has them crashing around the pipes and boards overhead, causing sparks and splinters to rain down on the player. Combined with the disorienting nature of the space, the combine suppressor that emerges at the top of the stairwell is used to reintroduce an appropriate level of intensity and to create a sense of a struggle as the player continues to scramble closer to their goal. Cool. Oh. Come on, give me some of that ambient sound back, baby. Those beams are coming from the top of this tower, right? Oh. Yeah, that's right. Take a lot of hits. Nice. I need that. Give it. Oh, biotics. Talking about biotics. Oh. And how the, uh, 
how the alternate name for the suppressor is the ATB, the antibiotic something or other. So if I'm a biotic and they're antibiotic, is that mean they're against me? Updating biodats. Dissonance resolved. That's another thing you're just talking about. Cognitive dissonance. Uh, if they have anything, if they think or do anything outside of their orders, they report it so that their biodat can be updated to reduce any thoughts going against their duties. I almost want to just restart the game so I can get the audio back. Three max left. We tried just doing this. I'll save right here. Main menu. Can you save file? Oh, I think it's back. Much better, okay. Don't you... Hey, don't you dare... Throw a man hack at me. And he's gone. Oh, he's really going far. Alright, we'll see ya. Hello. And one oh eight. Officer injured, standing down, Vizcon scanning. Friendly confirmed. All right. No, 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 no. So awesome. Three left. Red leak. <laughs> Red leak on hostile. Wow, being right handed behind a wall like this really sucks. Don't 
One left. All right, I'm ready. I hear you. Oh, you sneaky. Wow. Damn, that was a dramatic death, too. 10 out of 10 right there. Sorry, just checking real quick. Yeah, Dad? It looks like you will be able to get into the vault from up there. There's a terminal that extends a bridge to the entrance. What's the security like inside? I got it all laid out in front of me, and I'll tell you. There is security. But I've never seen anything like it. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I guess I'll have to improvise. Uh, don't worry, honey. I'll figure it out. Out of pistol ammo? First time that's happened. Well, have to use some of this. I love the red lights. All right. Alex, dead ahead. Those controls dock the vault to the station. On it. Another just absolutely, like, chilling, amazing part of the game in VR. But let's listen to a little bit about it first. At the start of the previous map, we introduced the tractor beam, a failsafe device used to catch the falling vault when the last substation was knocked offline. In this location, the console looks like it could be used to control the tractor beam to dock the vault for entry via the nearby gantry on the left. We decided to have the vault crash to the ground spectacularly, Boy. but for this to work emotionally, we needed the scene to increase in tension beforehand. The whole vault docking console is absurd by design. If the console appeared too much like a legitimate puzzle, playtesters could take too long and let the air out of the scene, unsure if there was something that they could actually solve. The more inscrutable the machine looked, the more likely they were to interact with the levers and play along with the unfolding disaster. The first phase of the puzzle extends the catwalk and unlocks the main lever bank, which responds to the player's input, engaging them in the solution. Every subsequent lever thrown does nothing except increase the tension as things continue to go wrong. The back and forth radio dialogue between Alex and Russell completes the scene with growing panic and keeps players in the moment, flipping levers in an attempt to save the vault. God, I, I want to see a console like this that actually is a puzzle. This has lots of like interactive elements and stuff like that. But I really love this moment because it's just like exactly what he said. It's just so chaotic. And I still remember how I felt the first time I did this scene. It's just beautifully done. Being left-handed means you're a child of the devil. So there's a trade-off for you. Oh, Devil seems like kind of a cool dude, though. Okay. Here we go. Alright. Here we go. Exactly. Time to go rescue the savior of humanity. You know, honey, he 
You haven't been doing too bad yourself. Earth could have used you in the Seven Hour War. Maybe we'd have lasted eight. All right. Looks like the bridge is fully extended. Just need to gently dock the vault to the bridge. How hard can that be? Oh, God. Okay, well, one of these has to bring in the vault for docking. Right? Right? Almost certainly. Maybe? No, not that one. Alex, the bridge isn't moving. Why isn't the bridge not moving? I know. Russ, I can see it not moving. Fire sound, so convincing that I had to look around in my room. They're like, wait a minute, is that in my room? But no, it's not. All right. Five years ago, we placed playtesters beneath an idling Half-Life 2 Strider. It was a really simple prototype, but the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. This experience convinced us we should pursue a Strider encounter in VR. And as a result, we built dozens of prototypes over the next few years. Some designs pressed playtesters into very close contact with the Strider. Some had a Strider chase them through a simple environment, or shoot at them through porous cover. In other cases, the Strider would destroy a wall the player was hiding behind or give a performance the player was meant to observe. A prototype built in 2017 squared the player directly off with a Strider in a quarry, combining many of our ideas into one experience. Based on the success of this prototype, the team moved on to building the shipping experience ahead of you, although it would take another three years of refinement to complete. Each iteration brought us a new set of rules and players' expectations. The Strider Encounter Ahead is a carefully crafted collection of beats shaped by our own ideas of what would be exciting and fun, refined over a long period of playtesting. It really pays off. Only thing that was disappointing to me though is uh, they replaced all of the Strider noises, and they don't sound nearly as cool as they did in Half-Life 2, in my opinion. <laughs> at least this survived. You didn't, though.
Through many iterations of the Strider encounter, we would find ourselves having functionally solved the problem, only to realize that we also had to fictionally contextualize the solution so that it made sense. For example, we designed this entire map to include combat with Combine soldiers. But how should we fictionally place them in this destroyed space? How could we put a disabled Strider close to the player? What were the Combine doing here prior to the vault collapse? This soldier was placed here to communicate to the player that some Combine were in the area investigating an antlion infestation before the vault fell on them. In fact, you can see some dead antlions nearby. If you listen closely, you'll hear the soldier trying to contact the rest of his squad, letting the player know that they are not alone and that there is likely to be more combat ahead. She sounds like the actress of that collaborator woman. Did I ever play Firewatch? I feel like you can really feel their touch in this game. Um, I never played Firewatch, but I watched a full playthrough of it. I definitely know what you're talking about. Now, I was talking about that earlier. Like I, you know, the, the Campo Santo, Campo Santo, whatever, team, with all their games that are, like, non-violent and are really about, like, character development and emotional relatability and stuff like that, I just wonder how they felt being pulled at, into Valve and having to make a game with a lot of violence, a lot of conflict, a dystopian world. It's, like, so different from what they're used to. It's... I'm sure they're thrilled to be able to work on like a legendary franchise, but it's so against what they previously established. <laughs> a combine, well. You made me feel emotionally attached to you because you're distraught over the destruction of your precious vault, but Gameplay's telling me to hate you, so I'm sorry. I have to go with the gameplay. Hopefully that was the most humane way to go about it. It just makes you feel guilty. How oh, the detail, all oh, the wreckage and everything. Classic. What? Although we could excuse a few random combine in this area left over from investigating the antline infestation, we needed a way to justify the large squads of combine in the combat encounters that occur later in the level. These two Combine are part of a squad sent down looking for survivors after the vault collapse, and their dialogue is designed to inform the player 
that this strider they have found may not be dead. Fictionally, it is the player's combat with these two soldiers that alerts the rest of the Combine in this area to the player's presence. Lucky break there. Could you imagine that thing blocking your way? Oh, man, rise. Don't jinx me. For many players, Striders are the most feared and powerful enemies in the Half-Life franchise, and we thought it would be interesting to flip player expectations on their head and experience what it would feel like to team up and cooperate with the Strider. Our initial concept was inspired by Aesop's fable of the Lion and the Mouse, with the player freeing a disabled Strider who had later helped the player escape by clearing the way forward. Initially, Aww. the parking garage was a combine silo, and it was much easier fictionally to have some type of combine device which could constrain a Strider without injury. When the location changed to a collapsed parking garage, we constrained the Strider by trapping it in the elevator shaft, held down by the elevator car. After being freed, the injured Strider would lash out at anything nearby, combine and player alike, as it tried to escape. This was a strong story when told aloud, but expressing it in a way that was understood by players turned out to be difficult. Keeping the Strider around throughout the level alternating between injured and angry states as the player slowly picked their way through the garage was confusing to playtesters, and we had a very hard time trying to find the right balance. Playtesting feedback was really consistent around this. So although we love the idea, we let it go in favor of a more straightforward and achievable dynamic of Hunter and Prey that eventually shipped. The year we spent pursuing the lion and a mouse idea wasn't wasted, however, as we created and refined many of the different story beats that shipped. We also crafted some performances and technology that led to the success of the final experience. Moments like that are great. Humanize the enemy right before you're forced to kill them. <sighs> yeah, playtesters do it again. Thanks for the follow. Awkward jitters. Now, when I first played this part, this confused me so much. I had no idea where I was supposed to go, because I did this. And went over here. And I was just like, what, I, I can't get through here. Okay, it must be decoration or something. And I just was unable to move on. I thought, like, is the elevator supposed to be coming down? Is it, like, what's... Why isn't it working? And nowhere in the game before this point was there any gameplay that had you do this. Go in and push this up so that you can crawl through. It's like there's... This is the first time this has ever been done. And that caught me... I got so stuck on that part. Thanks for the follow, Prees. Prees understand. Check something on my phone real quick. Since it is morning here. Almost 10. Okay. Because sometimes what happens is, is my landlord does showings of rooms and he gives like very little notice. So it'll just suddenly be like, oh, by the way, we're showing your room. And I will have been streaming uh, like 10 plus hours like a maniac. And then going into the morning, 
and there's a chance that he would just like be at my door with a group of people and then I'm sitting here in VR completely unaware of what's going on around me and then he would just suddenly open my door and walk in with a big group of people and <laughs> I wouldn't even know. Yeah, and I'm crawling on the floor of VR on. You remember commentary notes getting really disruptive during this fight, having to sit and listen. Yeah, this is a super intense part, probably the most intense part in the game. And uh, the whole reason I'm playing this is for the commentary. So yeah, if you isn't going to be the best experience of this part because I'm going to be stopping and listening a lot. So. Um, but you can see my first playthrough of this on YouTube, if you really care. See my real-time reactions. Real first reactions. Cool jump, bro. all this stuff. Oh, here's a actual floppy floppy disk. Nice. Not just one of these bad boys. Diskette. I'm surprised I never saw one of these before in game. Well, and a CD? Dude. The CDRW. I hear it. I hear the cosmos. Oh, here it is. Oh, <laughs> that was weird. Scarier in VR when something just explodes in your face. Um, what I was gonna say about um, uh, about awkward stuff while well, VR in VR when someone just walks into your room with a group of people is that if I'm like playing Beat Saber. Which usually, because I get extremely sweaty when I'm playing Beat Saber, I do things you might imagine to reduce the amount of sweating happening. That would be even worse to be like dancing around like crazy with a VR headset on. And I play like Expert Plus, so I'd be like especially flailing, just like super sweaty, unresponsive to all the people in the room, and then they just walk in on that. Like that's unrecoverable amount of awkward. also part of the well, that's most fun because now you've mastered upgrade all your weapons and you're able to execute everything you've learned well I haven't upgraded my weapons on purpose it's also treadmill accessories for VR right yeah yeah there are treadmills but none of them are affordable and they're not really as good as people think they think it's like the ultimate solution for like locomotion but it's just big and super loud and it doesn't really feel like walking it's just like you're on a treadmill at the point, you just have to own it and make it more awkward for them than it is for you. <laughs> True. Your landlord shouldn't be in your apartment w without your say. So anyway, what's the thing is that uh, he gives an email warning ahead of time saying that he's going to do a showing whether we're here or not. And he just does it. 
technically at least does give a warning. But, uh, they have automatic permission to do so. I have enough power in my controllers to do this whole sequence. Okay, they're at like half power. Alright. Stand up for this. Glide down. The Strider encounter boils down to a set of performances and the Strider's AI driven minigun. Maintaining the illusion that the Strider was aware of and hunting the player while delivering these performances required a delicate coordination between animation and AI systems. We used a variety of approaches to make the Strider feel like an intelligent creature hunting the player. Players in VR move very slowly by first-person shooter standards, so we have the Strider alternate between chasing performances, following the player through the level, and then hunting performances, focused on tracking and firing at the player, or looking for them. Triggering the different stages of this pursuit took a lot of playtesting. We paid close attention to how playtesters would move through the level, and then built the triggers and iterated on the animations to support the most common behaviors. It was very much a back and forth conversation to evolve a beat into something that most players would believe the strider was truly hunting them. Early playtesters would grow weary of being shot at without any downtime or contrasting experiences. So we identified the beats that would create that contrast and layer them in when we saw playtesters become fatigued. Things like the Strider bashing the wall, walking over you, chasing you up an elevator shaft, all acted as ways to break up the experience and surprise the player. Whenever we had feedback a playtester was growing or looked bored or fatigued, we would brainstorm different ways to insert these beats, and then test it to verify that they were paced correctly. One of the tools we used was a sophisticated look-at system on the Strider. The system tracked the player and would procedurally orient different parts of the Strider to face the player. The body, minigun, and gauss cannon all had different lookouts to break up the effect when the strider lost or acquired the player. These could be independently enabled or disabled at specific times to make it feel like the strider was directly addressing the player. In each animation of the sequence, the lookout on the minigun and body would be enabled or disabled based on whether the strider should be able to see the player at that point. All right. Shaking hands beforehand, Wh wherever your hand is, is it over here? Oh, I can't quite reach it. Alright. Go. Alex, the Strider! Look out, it's alive! Oh, moving. Oh, I did jinx up! Textbook! Textbook jinxing, Russell! See, I missed the sound from Half-Life 2, when it was like, it's a lot chunkier sounding. Oh. It was important to communicate clearly to the player that they were being hunted by the Strider at this point. <laughs> we wanted don't players say. to see the Strider dust itself off and fixate on them, so that there would be no doubt that they were now the prey. This elevator ride was a useful tool to achieve this, as it is one of the few moments of the game that we have a captive audience. The elevator door facing the Strider was carefully designed to provide enough protection so that players would feel safe, but enough visibility to see the Strider's performance. Grab 
got the commentary. During development, we talked a lot about the experience of the Strider minigun blasting through the walls and floors of the parking garage while hunting the player. But we weren't sure we would be able to deliver destructible cover until around six months prior to shipping. To address this, we designed the destructible cover to visually communicate that it was being broken down prior to actually fracturing and breaking. Initially, the cover would look like an unremarkable piece of concrete or other building material, but when it took sufficient damage, it would start to visibly crack and throw off dust particles. When the same piece of cover took further damage, it would then fracture into pre-cut physics objects and generate more dust and debris particles. Through playtesting, we determined how much damage the cover should be able to take before breaking down and forcing the player to move. In the end, the destructible cover system allowed us to deliver on our goal of giving players the impression that the Strider was capable of tearing through the parking garage with its minigun as it pursued them. They should have had the people doing the commentary uh, just like shout their commentary and it'd be like, all right, so over here you can see it's the Strider shooting. Oh shit, okay, no, he's going down this way. Like, oh, no, no. All right, so when we made this, it's just, it just like fit the feeling of the moment. In this area of the map, we began hearing from some play testers that they found the minigun firing monotonous. What? Originally, the gun would fire at a set rate, regardless of the player's behavior. To address the monotony, we made several improvements to the Strider AI running just the minigun. The minigun will fire if it sees the player, but take a moment to acquire them. Play an acquired sound to warn them they have locked on, and then stitch the bullets towards the player in its first volley. The minigun volleys themselves were broken up to become more staccato with random intervals in between volleys. If the player ducks behind cover, the strider will keep firing where it last saw the player for a short period. These changes to the minigun behavior eliminated the monotony and gave players the impression that they were fleeing a living creature. Well, I think uh, the monotony is going to be eliminated in multiple ways. So weird having this crooked building in VR. To keep the Strider engagement interesting throughout the level, we knew that we wanted to challenge the player's understanding of what the Strider was capable of. We identified this upcoming room as a space where most players felt they understood the Strider's capabilities and built this next beat to surprise them. To create the door frame bash moment, we used the Strider's animation to drive an offline destruction simulation that could be played back by the game engine in real time. We coupled this with particle effects and physics impulses on interactive physics objects in the room to make the player feel unsafe. To fully sell the idea that the Strider has been searching for and has found the player, we gave the Strider a moment to pause after tearing away the wall to look at the player before it started to fire again. Alright, this moment is really cool.
When playtesting the Strider encounter, we learned that players enjoyed fighting a challenging enemy, but responded negatively if they took damage in a way that seemed unfair. This gave to address too? this, we used audio to communicate the state of the Strider. For example, when the Strider did not have line of sight to the player, it would emit a periodic hunting sound. This sound was meant to communicate to the player that they were currently safe, but that the Strider was still there. Once the Strider had seen the player, it would switch to its chasing state and make corresponding chasing sounds. When the Strider what? was ready to start firing at the player, they it would talk? emit a target acquired sound before firing. Players quickly learned this pattern of sound cues and no longer complained about being caught unaware of the Strider's targeting state. Yo, I'm gonna check this car real quick if that's okay with you. Oh, okay. Oh, jeez. God damn it. Just make me invincible. So I can enjoy the sequence. Oh, I have to load again. Hopefully it was worth the wait. Yes, Strider is just... Is a better outcome. Save again. the music there in this part 100%
Can't I hold all these grenades? need a bucket. Where's my dish soap? I need to squeeze a little. We needed to familiarize the player with the Strider's Gauss cannon firing sequence, so they'd be able to recognize it when they saw it again later in the map. This particular area of the map went through a lot of iteration, as we searched for ways to reliably place the player in the right spot, at the right time, looking at the right thing. The Gauss cannon, as it charged up and fired. To achieve this, we ultimately settled on using a two-handed roller door. It requires the player to stand in a specific position and orientation, and occupies their hands so we know they aren't teleporting or interacting with anything else. We even know the precise moment that the door clears their eyeline, so we can be assured that they're going to see what we want them to see. Oh, you know what I'm gonna do, eh? You think you're so smart? Well, did you think someone would go over here? And be like... Hey, I can't see anything over there. Hold up. Up Strider. Russell, big gun up ahead. I think I've got an idea. I just had it too, and it's a good one.
When the central theme of this map was the lion and the mouse, the encounter with the Strider ended at this point. The Strider simply exited off into the sunset. We intended for the Strider to reappear in a subsequent fight, perhaps even attacking the Combine alongside the player. But this idea was only pursued briefly before being cut. The problem was that playtesters felt cheated that they didn't get to destroy the Strider after being hunted and harassed by it for so long. In the final map, once the player steps into the rat maze below, the Strider reappears and begins hunting the player again. Because Alex does not possess any weapons that can damage the Strider, we explored a variety of ways that the player could take out the Strider using something found in the environment. These included ideas like triggering missiles on a downed Combine helicopter, using a Combine mortar emplacement, or kicking off some type of physics event to sweep the Strider's legs out and kill it. We built prototypes of many of these ideas and eventually narrowed down to the mounted gun solution that shipped. It was simple, repeatable, and was one of the easier solutions to train under fire. All right. Citizen overdoses on drugs. Alright, one less commentary before big stuff. Wow, I never realized it's coming out of the back of a vehicle like that. We wanted the player to end the encounter by killing the Strider in a dramatic boss fight using a weapon found in the environment. This meant that we had to introduce a new weapon which was more powerful than the player's equipped weapons and which had to remain in the environment after the fight. A mounted gun on an abandoned Combine vehicle made the most sense, and after some initial tests with the downed Combine helicopter repurposed from Half-Life 2, we settled on the armored personnel carrier since one had already been built for use in another section of the game. Since the gun mechanism itself would be seen for the first time while under pressure from the Strider, it had to have an aiming and firing mechanism that the player would understand immediately. We prototyped a variety of designs, from a machine gun that auto-fired as soon as the player grabbed the handle, to a gun that fired a sticky bomb that had to be detonated by the player after it had hit its target. The auto-firing machine gun was too simple to use and lacked dramatic effect, and the extra interaction required to detonate the sticky bomb was too much to teach the player while under duress. <laughs> We settled on a design that requires one hand to aim and another to both reload and fire. Requiring the player to push the firing mechanism all the way forward to reload was necessary to prevent the player from firing too rapidly. The gun's shell reloading animation is directly driven by the player's motion and communicates to the player that they must move their hand all the way forward to reload before being able to pull it back to fire. All right.
So this is going to be the whole ending sequence of the game here. It is a hell of a thing. But I'm curious what the commentary is going to be like. Alright Alex, well, that tractor beam over there looks like it'll get you up to the vault. Got it. Just walk into it. almost expressed a little bit of emotion. Oh, that's right, this is kind of similar to Control. <coughs> okay, but this is weird. But, I don't know, it doesn't look too dangerous. Alright, again, commentary is going to kind of ruin the suspense, but that's the whole reason I'm here. Thanks for the follow, Dolphin. As the player enters the vault and is immersed in its warped reality, they lose contact with Russell. With Russell no longer available to explain what the player was seeing, we had to communicate the important concepts of the vault through the use of visual effects, physics, sound design, and music. The most important concept was that the errant bursts of uncontrolled energy causing anti-reality events was spillover of the Vortigaunt energy being used to keep the prisoner in the vault as his influence occasionally gained the upper hand through influence. cracks in the field. Starting from the vault crash in the prior map, we used this piece of musical sound design to represent the newly uncontrolled Vortigaunt energy being released from the vault. And this piece to accompany the reality bending bursts caused and swayed by the G-Man's increasing reach. Within the vault, we repeat these motifs to reinforce the Vortigaunt energy mechanic that the player is ultimately able to use as a weapon against the Combine, short circuit to release the prisoner, save Eli, and complete the game. Damn, spoilers, holy shit. I'm kidding, but... Huh. Never notice there's a newspaper in here. Robotai Umna Anya Dolvo? Oh weird, is this little thing with the hose? I never noticed these little details. Okay, anyway. Really cool seeing all this in full detail though. Last time I was here it was with my much older computer. stuff in zero gravity is so weird in VR. This is like as close to going to space as I'll ever get. It even does little haptic vibrations as stuff bumps against your hands too. Kind of feels a little bit real.
pacing too, how it go from loud, overwhelming noise, it just sealed into silence again. Just like, wait, am I back? Is this, is this real? Not real? And you're like, alright, well, I'll just go into the next room. Oh! standing here in VR though. Very unsettling. I just love how it's like this entire building was just abruptly just grabbed, lifted into the air, and just smashed into a prison such a combine style to just like rip things out of the earth, just smash right through human structures. All right, everything's fine. Just sit down, you know. It's almost one-to-one -one with my actual couch. Kind of amazing, actually. Back when I did a a cheat run of the game, where I no clipped and stuff, all the keys of that piano are actually playable too. Not just there for decoration. Does no clipping feel in VR? It's fine for me, but it's it would probably be uncomfortable for a lot of people because it's like just freely flying around, no limits. Combine would make sure that rent isn't even a day late. Probably they'd make pretty good landlords. I mean, they'd it fit the uh, personality type. I love that.
Right from the earliest days of the story design, the audio team established a corresponding aesthetic plan that employed increasingly strange sound design, soundscapes, and music, culminating in a soundscape appropriate to the broken reality of the vault and Alex's encounter with the G-Man. While the vault level was being designed, it became apparent that the accompanying music would be crucial to selling the surreal nature of the vault. Most music in the vault is based on the musical palindrome you hear in the sideways room. By utilizing variations of elements in this piece and warping them with multiple types of pitch and time bending, we created an appropriately abstract sonority. While strange and dislocating, it was still consistent unto itself, as well as conceptually relevant to the multidimensional nature of the G-Man and the Vortigaunt energy imprisoning him. Nice. the soap. I totally forgot about these parts. So cool. Oh, I 
have a I'm using a Vive, first generation Vive headset, index controllers, first gen base stations. My first playthrough of this was with the Vive controller, so it's my first time using index. Need a thumbnail here, so uh I... All right. Half Life Alex was set in a realistic type world with familiar rules. The G-Man's presence in the vault gave us fictional justification to experiment with different distortions of reality and embrace surrealism in these spaces. Early experiments with gravity anomalies and distorting spatial expectations were promising as the immersiveness of VR worked to exaggerate their impact. The surreal environments proved to be fertile for puzzle solving as well, but they tended to stall the pacing at the point in the game we needed it to be ramping up, so they weren't included in the final release. The most notable of these was in the mirrored apartment. Players originally had to spot and correct differences between the top and bottom apartment spaces oh, in order to escape that area. Instead of surreal interactive puzzles, the first half of the vault became a journey through an increasingly bizarre set of spaces that were once the apartment building the G-Man was captured in. Ah, oh, okay. God, that would have been cool, but I understand why they didn't put it in. still die, which I, is one of my biggest complaints of this part of the game. They should just not let you die here, like it's a finale, come on. Supercharging the Russells with Vorticon energy helped us achieve the goal of having an unarmed player overpower the last few Combine soldiers that were guarding the G-Man. Initially, grenades and a zero-gravity hallway was how we achieved this. 
Separately, we've been experimenting with using the Russells to pull and throw energy bolts from Vortigon energy nodes. This was a natural fit for the Vault combat section since it evokes the concept of supercharging the gravity gun at the end of Half-Life 2 and works with the player's well-mastered Russell's throwing mechanic. This new mechanic was introduced at a point where pacing was critical, so it had to be intuitive to pick up and quick to master. Giving the player the Vortigon energy attack not only helped to tie together that this was Vortigon energy containing the demon, but helped to further solidify the deep Vortigon connection to Alex. It also gave the player a chance to briefly feel like they had superpowers and be able to use that ability in a visceral, deeply physical way that's impossible in real life. In my first run of this part in the game, it took me like five or ten minutes to figure out that I'm supposed to pull the energy out of the walls. That wasn't obvious at first. Uh, and then yeah, I died like three times. Also. Still a cool moment though. Like, I shouldn't have to be worrying about this. See you later, Hobo Noah. I'll read back in all your comments and stuff after the sequence here. Once I'm inside, a tiny detail a lot of people miss is the fact that there are there's a dead advisor laying on the ground. It kind of has weird implications. Oh yeah, I saw the drawing of the G-Man in the big mural. Yeah, and I love the 
shows the desperation the Combine had to contain him, which is how, like, reckless this capture was. But death gives life meaning. <laughs> True, but it's still a video game with... with theatrical elements. Dramatic effect. All right, let's rescue Gordon Freeman. Prison, Gordon Freeman. So, who are you? Perhaps what I am is not as important as what I can offer you in exchange for coming all this way. Some believe the fate of our worlds is inflexible. My employers disagree. They authorize me to nudge things in a particular direction from time to time. What would you want nudge, Miss Vance? The Combine off Earth. I want the Combine off Earth. Uh, that would be a considerably large nudge. Too large, given the interests of my employers. Well, you asked. What if I could Cassie. offer you something you don't know you want? Mother 3 English translation? Your father die. Unless. What? Unless what? Unless you were to take matters into your own hands. <laughs> hmm. 
release your father. Good. As a consequence of your action, this entity will continue, and this entity will not. Right. So, he's okay. Right? He lives. My dad lives. You are aware that you've proven yourself to be of extraordinary value. A previous hire has been unable or unwilling to perform the tasks laid before him. We have struggled to find a suitable replacement until now. No! I, I, I just want to go home. Send me home! I'm afraid you misunderstand the situation, Miss Lance. Wait! Hey, wait! 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 Listen to the sick ass tune while we wait for the end of credit sequence. Suggesting that Vortigon could easily kill an advisor. Uh, I mean, she's supposed to be kind of like overcharged. Surprised there wasn't a, a developer commentary just talking specifically about the G Man. Ready for it. Beats about to drop. Ooh. Oh, Gordon. She's gone, Gordon. She's gone. Son of a bitch, it has unforeseen consequences. I knew it. When I get my hands on him, I'm gonna kill him. Oh, you're talking to me? Oh. Mm. Sorry.
<laughs> there's the end. Okay. Now the game menu is like way far away from me. I can't even read anything. No one talks about the G-Man. He isn't real. He's just a mass hallucination. Well, a lot of people talk about the G-Man, actually. It's kind of interesting. It's like the beginning of Half-Life 1. You see a scientist just casually talking to the G-Man. An opposing force, you see the G-Man talking to one of the drill sergeants in the distance. Uh, and then episode 2... Eli says, our mutual friend. You know who I'm talking about. Now Alex talks about him. Gordon has had the most experience. We didn't talk about him. I really need to watch Final Hours. Yeah, Epistle 3. That's a whole other interesting thing, too. Anyone that doesn't know, uh, the lead writer that started the whole Half-Life story, Mark Laidlaw, he had left Valve and like a year or a couple years, I think, after he left, he wrote a big blog post telling the world how he would have written Episode 3 uh, with all the names changed. But then people, you know, filled in the gaps and figured out what he was talking about. So it is really cool to see what he would have done. Is this my first walkthrough? No. This is my third time going all the way through the game. First time was brand new, right on launch date. I binged the game hardcore. I had kind of a shitty computer. Second time... I cheated all the way through because I wanted to no clip around and I looked through like all the detail, read all the posters, took a bunch of screenshots, tested a bunch of stuff to see if there's any like hidden secrets and all that. Now this time was just um, with my new computer with developer, developer commentary on. My stream quality a lot higher than it was back then. I have it on 60 FPS, much higher bit rate, 720. But I love Half-Life, like everything about the series. I mean, I obviously have my own complaints, but in general, I really like it. When I was young, I always thought Gordon and the G-Man were the same person. Because, oh, why? Because G equals Gordon Man? G-Free Man? Oh? I think a lot of the development, kind of like Star Wars, in a way, where... You created a story, a set of characters so long ago, back before you knew that your product, movie, slash game, slash whatever was going to be wildly successful. And then as you get more people, more writers, more higher budget and everything, you kind of start to realize like, oh, we probably shouldn't have written this. And like, oh, now we got to deal with this and this. Like, I remember the writers of Half-Life 1 openly admit that they thought, they thought the Nihilinth was a big mistake story-wise. But at the time, in the late 90s, people expected there to be a big boss at the end of a game. And they just had to, like, slap together some big boss fight big boss you know to have at the end of the game otherwise people complain so they just like well, whatever big alien thing kill it but it's like you know they have all this money and they can do whatever they want they can like you know alex here doesn't really have a big boss fight i mean there is the strider and everything but it's not like some unique character that you've never seen that comes out of nowhere and is the big boss at the end it's just you know. Have I played Zen in Black Mesa? I have not played the Black Mesa recreation of everything. I have watched a full playthrough of it, and I think it it's extremely impressive and everything. I don't really have any urge to play it myself. But I think it's cool. And yeah, Zen is absolutely beautiful, the way that they imagined it. Uh, 
All right, so almost 11 a.m. here. I've been streaming almost 11 hours. So total, this run took me about 22 hours. And I really took my time, obviously. All of my runs, I really take my time. Because it's just, why be in VR if you're not going to pay extra attention to the environment? So whenever my next stream of this is... Um, I would like to do mods for this, which I have never done. One of them is the crowbar add-on. I want to see what that's like. There's a few custom maps. I might even play the Vine Sauce Alex map where you can have a snowball fight with Scoot. In the SDK for Half-Life 1, there's a comment that says that G-Man is a misunderstood servant of the people. Right, I remember hearing about that. I mean, he... As far as I know, yeah, G-Man is just a... Uh, a... sneaky entity that can... that does the bidding of powerful forces around the universe. And as he says, he can do gentle nudges to push one faction's wishes more to the front of the line than other ones. So... Clearly, humanity isn't in his best interest right now. He's just kind of like, well, humans have a... There's a couple of humans that are really powerful. Let's cause total chaos on this planet, weed out all the weak ones, and let's find a really good human, throw him away in a storage unit somewhere, and we'll use him on other worlds for other causes. Like his toys. This is absolutely insane. I think I'll rewatch the Vine Sauce maps after this to remember happier times. Right. Black Mesa has nailed the Nihilant fight. I find Black Mesa way better than whatever Valve did with Half-Life 2 in Episode 2. Nonsense. Yeah. Also, thanks for the follow, um, Dynamite. Uh, I don't know. I have such intense nostalgia for what Valve produced. It's hard for me to say, like, oh, what Black Mesa did is just better and it's hard for a lot of people who didn't grow up with these games to see as much contextual value in them because there's been so many other games. I don't think just nostalgia is, isn't entirely why I like the previous games. Like Half-Life 1 is still my favorite Half-Life game despite all these later ones having significantly higher budgets and just overall being like mind-blowing over the top and detailed and everything. I just think not only did I enjoy one, but it's very important to me and my upbringing, how it influenced my life and getting into game design and 3D modeling and just being a part of internet communities and met a lot of people playing Half-Life multiplayer mods. It was just very formative for me personally. And it was important in context to the game industry and i've said all this before but like half-life one was the most like narratively complex fps at the time i know there were games like what like system shock and i know marathon another fps out there that had a lot of story and everything but the way that they delivered story was innovative it was all just happening around you you weren't forced to listen to any of it. You didn't have to sit and read the whole instruction manual to understand the story. It's just the way how it, the story kept with the flow of the gameplay. It was a very fluid experience. It innovated in artificial intelligence, or AI, and how they responded to you. It felt really real, how a lot of them would retreat and navigate through hallways to find you, used the 
One of the first games used skeletal animation. It was uh, visually way ahead of things, where like Quake had to have the entire palette of a map all had to be constrained within 256 colors, meaning every single texture of every model and everything had 256 colors. It's why everything looks so similar. Whereas Half-Life had a limit of 256 colors per texture, meaning you could have a lot more variety in the environment design. Had fully voiced characters, characters that delivered dialogue to you. They had friendly characters, things that fought on your side. It's just, it did so many things that no other games did at the time. They also played them in order. They were released. Somehow the ending of episode 2 was never spoiled for me. Amazing. I was spoiled about the game, about the G-Man and Alex, and I couldn't really play the game myself. I had to wait for somebody else to play it. I'm glad I could help. Half-Life 2 is my first Half-Life, so it's really special to me. It, it is, yeah, it's because I like 1. I still really love 2. And the episodes, and Alex. I mean, I, and Opposing Force, even Blue Shift. I mean, only Half-Life thing I've never played is Decay. And that's because it's really unusual and hard to get a hold of because it's like a PlayStation game or something. But I've watched playthroughs of it, so I know what it's about. Story unfolded in front of the player instead of through cutscenes and text. That was unique and great. System Shock is very impressive, but it's hardly playable nowadays. Decay considered canon. <sighs> that. I don't know. It's a lot of big, weird questions. Not a whole lot happens in Decay, from what I remember. Decay is the cooperative game. Replay as two female HEV suit scientists. Uh, big thing is there's it's Gina and Colette, and Gina is the one that delivers the sample to the test chamber that starts the Resonance Cascade. Um, I, I even watched a full playthrough of it and I barely remember what even happens in Decay. I do know there's a secret ending to Decay where you can play as a Vortigaunt temporarily. Very short amount of time. Yeah, it's hard to, to really know if it's canon because Opposing Force and Blue Shift and Decay were all made by teams that aren't Valve. And um, Opposing Force really just invented a whole bunch of new enemies and factions out of nowhere that kind of mess up the story a lot. So it would be more convenient if Opposing Force was not canon. And the fact that Black Mesa was just blown up, I think, is fitting to the story. Yeah, made by Gearbox. Am I going to play today? I just finished. Just finished Half-Life Alex on dev commentary mode. I'll be wrapping up the stream here. I've been going on 11 hours. Yeah, you missed it. <laughs> I don't I stream at really weird times, so usually people are going to sleep right when I start and then they're waking up right when I end. Cool thing is that someone converted this whole title screen area into VR chat and it still looks pretty good. Like you can just freely roam around the space. Yeah, I suppose this is good for Europeans, so I'm glad I, I can cater to someone. So what, I would be starting my stream at like, like 6 in the morning or so, parts of Europe, and ending around noon. I guess that's a little better than starting around midnight and ending at 6 in the morning. How about Australia? 
uh, the Australian hours. That would be, I'd be starting my stream around noon and ending my stream around like 6 p.m. in the evening for Australians and East Asians. Oh, uh, and there was a very special intro to this stream that you guys should check out if you missed it. It was really dumb, and I just was making stuff up on the spot, but it was fun. Uh, so, like uh, I do with all my streams, all of this goes on to YouTube as soon as I can. I try to, as soon as I put the stream down, I try to get it ch uploading, but because this is like an 11 hour stream, it takes a long time to process until I can even get it to start uploading. So usually the next day, it will all be online. Or you can watch the VOD on Twitch, of course. It'll still be up. And I might stream all of the final hours a little conflicted because it's basically like a, a full-length movie just sitting and watching it and you pay for it i wouldn't upload that to youtube i would just do it on twitch it would only be live but that's like i have not seen it yet but it's a very thorough look at valve when Valve went silent for so many years, talking about what was going on, and they talk a lot about Half-Life Alex and its development. Uh, yeah, Final Hours is more than just uh, a movie. It's also a lot of stuff to read, a lot of concept art. Even has some like interesting interactive stuff in it too. I'll have to look more into that. The next time I stream, I will most likely be doing some mods for Alex. Like I said, I can do the, try to crowbar mod. Might even try the compound bow mod and then some uh, custom user maps. I don't know when that's going to happen. No one really ever knows when I stream. And I might even disappear for a few months again like I usually do. Who knows? Final Hours is more like an interactive PDF, not a lot of video. Oh. Well, it still could be interesting to stream. Alright, I'm just going to see who I'm going to raid. I will not be raiding Shadow Legends. Don't worry. Um, who's even on? Yeah, thanks for stopping by. Rete Eel. <laughs> I want to know how to pronounce your name. But I really should do, because you've told me how to pronounce your name. And I know you say, it doesn't matter. I know you told me how to pronounce it, like, months ago. Like, last year. I could look in your chat history and, like, go way back and see when you explained it. Rete Rectiel. Rediel. Um, who's streaming? Not trying to scare you. Game called Enlisted. A lot of people are playing. The World War II thing that just came out. Anyone on my list is playing Half-Life Alex or other Half-Life related games, I'll definitely raid them before anyone else. But usually only people streaming are like really big name streamers where a raid wouldn't really matter. Hmm. 
but it's also kind of weird. I don't want to just find someone who has no viewers and raid them. Because it's... Because I, I, I like to help. Nothing wrong with that. But it's it just puts you in an awkward situation. Because people start getting weird when you give them viewers. I mean, there's not even that many people here. I mean, I appreciate that you're all here, of course. Like one time I had like 800 people on my stream and I raided someone that had like five viewers and the person just about had a heart attack and then they were there just like on their knees bowing before me and I hate that feeling. I hate being worshipped like that. I was just kind of like, haha, yeah, no problem. Hope you're enjoying your game. You're like, dude, dude, oh my god, thank you so, oh my god, I, oh, I can't believe, like, they completely stopped playing their game just to continuously praise me over and over. It's like, just please stop. And then after the stream was over, like, I was asleep, and they came back the next morning and they, like, messaged me a bunch of times on Discord, like, dude, dude, thank you so much, dude. Oh god, I can't believe I, it's... <laughs> And then, like, the next day, he's like, so are you going to be streaming again later? I'm just wondering, like, eh. Don't make it awkward, please. Yeah, when in doubt, raid the shrimp channel. Well, there is someone on my list streaming uh, Borrow Trauma, which is a really cool game that I've streamed before, might host them. She's cool. Only thing that's kind of funny though is like, I used to watch her stream a bunch. She really doesn't know who I am or anything about me. So I was always just kind of like, oh, thank you for the raid. And it's like, haha, no problem. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Flush emote. Come on. I'm trying to do this all through the team interface while this controller is about to die, so this is time limited. Come on. Come on, work! Oh my god, why is it glitching out? Let me click. Fuck. Oh, for f why isn't it okay let me get my remote keyboard this controller is not cooperating yeah i could also raid bob ross but bob never reads chat though so rude All right, go to this. I'm gonna raid Fuzzy Freaks. Cool streamer, plays a lot of horror stuff. Playing Borrow Trauma right now. It's really awesome. Cooperative multiplayer game about operating giant submarines, fighting scary sea creatures, and exploring the depths of the moon of Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> 